Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today as well. This is the second day of a certificate course on environmental crime and consortium studies. To catch you up on yesterday's events, uh, we started with inaugural address from Professor Dr. Sahani. Uh, then we followed with a keynote address from Dr. Sakit Badullah. He is head of Traffic India. He spoke on wildlife trafficking and its impact on human beings. First session was delivered by Ms. Sherlin Chin, Managing Director, Green Transparency. She discussed uh, a lot of problems related to environmental crimes, uh, ongoing issues worldwide with excellent examples. Then the next session, the second session was delivered by Dr. Madhid Rao. Uh, she's Associate Professor at University of Maryland. She spoke on conservation criminology. And uh, for today, we have two sessions lined up, session number three and session number four. So uh, in yesterday's event, we received a lot of good responses and when a majority of those responses were people who were asking how can they contribute. Uh, so there are two opportunities I want to highlight over here. So there is one opportunity from Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, which is a enforcement wing of uh, uh, Ministry of Environmental uh, and Conservation. So uh, they are seeking out for volunteers. Uh, you can go and check on their website. Uh, volunteers will help Wildlife Crime Control Bureau in managing uh, and informing and other sort of stuff related to uh, wildlife crimes. Uh, I can also share the link with you. And the other opportunity is from WWF. Uh, there's a program called Cyber Spotter. So this is where you can apply and be a cyber spotter. You can uh, uh, work as a person who uh, serves through internet. And if there are any potential threats where a person is training wildlife, you can report it. There are two, other, two opportunities where uh, I'll be sharing the link with you. And today is also International Biodiversity Day to happy International Biodiversity Day to everyone. Uh, so from now, uh, my colleague, uh, Shruti will take over. What do you, Shruti? Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all for day two on the certificate course on environmental crimes and conservation studies. For today's session three, we have with us Mr. Kartik Satyanarayan, who will be speaking on the topic wildlife crimes and conservation in India. It's my privilege to introduce him to all of you. Mr. Kartik Satyanarayan is a well-known wildlife conservationist who has been tirelessly involved in wildlife conservation, animal welfare, and nature protection for over 25 years. He is the co-founder and CEO of Wildlife SOS and heads the Wildlife SOS anti-poaching unit, Forest Watch. In 1995, he founded Wildlife SOS with Geeta Sishamani, dedicating this non-profit organization to protecting India's environmental and wildlife resources from unsustainable exploitation. Wildlife SOS changed the Indian history as they rescued over 600 performing dancing bears. They brought to an end to the centuries old barbaric practice and provided alternative livelihoods to the Karandar communities previously depending on the bears. Mr. Karthik manages Wildlife SOS as a CEO and oversees over 10 wildlife rescue and rehabilitation facilities for tigers, bears, leopards, reptiles, birds, and elephants. He is a TED International Fellow and recipient of many prestigious awards like Indira Gandhi Paryavaran Puraskar 2010, the Karamveer Puraskar of the Congo Civil Society 2009, and the San Diego Zoo Global Conservation Medal for Conservation in Action 2018. He has been also facilitated with the Maharani Uday Singh Award 2019 for his conservation and community rehabilitation work. He has been an invited speaker at the Lewis and Clark School in Oregon to speak about wildlife laws in India, along with the Delhi Police Training Academy in Najafgarh, amongst many others. We welcome you, sir. Good evening. To begin with, I would request 
all the participants to drop your questions or any queries they would like to ask sir in the chat window and they will surely be addressed we have a 90 minute session planned with mr satyanarayan to keep a track of time the first bell will be at 60 minutes and the second bell will be at 70 minutes and the last 15 to 20 minutes are dedicated solely to the question and answer round also i will be sharing the feedback form in the chat window during the end of the session and i require and i request every participant to fill that the platform is all yours sir now thank you sir you are on mute apologies for that thank you uh, dr shruti for that introduction and thank you dr ulas for uh, reaching out to me and inviting me to be a part of this uh, opportunity to interact with your participants and your students and uh, yes i am delighted at this uh, opportunity over here because it gives us a chance to talk to all of your uh, people who are interested in in this um, subject and i think without further ado i will get into the presentation because we are uh, you know we have a very finite time window and so we'll try and uh, keep it to that i would once again request every participant to please send in your name your email address and any questions any inquiries any doubts that you have please post that into the chat window we have other colleagues from my team here um, who will make sure that they keep responding to you Uh, as and when you ask questions to make it easy for you all to follow up i also have been joined by uh, another colleague who doesn't speak very much you can see um one of my dogs is keeping me company as well over here all right i'm going to share my screen and move into the presentation so we can move forward I'm not sure if this is the right presentation just a second. You might have to just bear with me for a minute, huh? Mahima you'll have to ask Ravinder to come and help me out over here there's a problem yes. with my computer Yes sir I'm just talking to him Can you please confirm uh, if you can see the presentation? Uh, there seems to be a problem with uh, the charger. Dal do please. Dead ho jayega. 
Uh, Shruti and Dr. Uh, Ulas, could you confirm if you can see the presentation over here? Yes, sir, we can see, but it's not on the larger window. Yes, we do. But it's visible. You can start. So how do I make it the larger window? Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't done this for a while. Uh, sir, just go on your slideshow. This is the presenter view. So I'm not able to do that. On, on top. It doesn't give me that option at the moment. It only says... Where it says end show tips top left. Tips, yeah. End show tips. What should I use? Slideshow. Is this better? The screen share is off. You'll have to switch it on again. So you may start the screen sharing again. This is a nightmare. Hold on, just a second. It's completely fine. We can understand. Uh, it's new to everybody, even if we, we teach. No, no, it. I used to do we this quite a bit, but I've just kind of lost. Uh, I've lost touch. Is this full screen? Yes, yes, definitely. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And you can see the pangolin, all of you? Yes, sir. We can see. Yes. Lovely. All right. So, sorry, apologies for that goof up uh, earlier. So, we'll just dive straight into this. And uh, I'm sure all of you recognize this, uh, this species over here. It's a pangolin and it's extremely, extremely endangered, rare and something that's very dear to my heart. So uh, I, I just hope um, this is one of the species that we'll all find still existing when we are done with this planet. You know, I, I feel very strongly about the amount of damage that human beings do to the planet. And uh, I just hope that we will leave it uh, spare at least some species the way we go we go at it all right so um i i'd like to say that you know um there's this one quote that always inspires me and i think it's one way to look at things uh, and it's a quote by mahatma gandhi which is the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way that nation's animal, you know, the animals there are treated. And I think this is one way of assessing every community, every society, every place, uh, and, and how the people are, and what kind of compassion they can share. And I'd like to start off with this point. Now, moving forward, moving forward, I'd like to uh, briefly say that, you know, uh, wildlife crime and uh, you know, crime against wild animals kind of perpetrated over the last, I would say, maybe 50, 60 years, largely. Before that, it was hunting was all legitimate. It was done as a pastime. And during the British Raj in India, hunting was very popular. And of course, India's rich biodiversity was like a treasure trove for people who wanted to hunt. And uh, this photo kind of indicates, you know, the number of leopards, tigers uh, and other uh, you know, flora and fauna that were being uh, decimated. But that's been, uh, you know, creating a huge decline in our wildlife species ever since, um, you know, we finished that era. Now, moving forward, um, I'd like to say that there are only two laws in our country, primarily, actually one which protects wildlife, which is the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. And then, of course, for domestic animals, you have the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960. And then you have the Forest Conservation Act of 1980. That kind of protects forests and is a, is a larger uh, encompassing law. Now, before I dive into the whole thing of, of crime and conservation, I'd like to just touch upon a couple of basic things that is necessary for all of us to know about the law that that all protection in India for wildlife kind of hinges on. And that's the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. And uh, this kind of comprehensively encompasses the different uh, ways that you can protect wildlife, but it also ensures that um, people have an opportunity, the enforcement agencies have an opportunity to take action where required. And it also lets people know what's permitted and what's not permitted. And there are schedules there are six different schedules uh, which list animals very clearly as to what is protected under what schedule and then it also clearly lays out what can and cannot be done and what's banned and what's not permitted in sanctuaries national parks and protected areas like tiger reserves etc 
So very, very briefly to go into this, the schedule, there are, like I said, there are those sh schedules, the six, five to six schedules over there. And so schedule one kind of has the elephant, the sloth bear, tigers, lions, leopards, all the big endangered species, rhinos, wolves, etc. And then of course, schedule one, part two has amphibians and replies like, like monitor lizards, uh, crocodiles, snakes, and uh, species like that. A lot of us don't even realize that even your average fish market is trading and trafficking in endangered wildlife right under our very noses. And it, it's largely down to lack of awareness and ignorance and sometimes just downright uh, you know, violation of laws and, and a blatant violation, in fact. And then, of course, you have Schedule 1 Part 3, which is, a, which is the ducks, and then you have the insects in Part 4. And then you have other snakes, uh, like the rat snakes, checkered keelbacks, etc., in Schedule 2 Part 2. And now, um, moving forward, very briefly again, when we speak during this conversation, you know, for the purpose of making sure everybody understands, these are some terminology that we use. So, you know, everybody understands what wildlife is, but basically it leaves out, you know, domestic animals, it leaves out pets, leaves out farm animals, but it also includes plants. A lot of people think wildlife only means animals, but it actually includes plants, mushrooms, and, and rare species of flora and fauna. And then trafficking, the word trafficking means, you know, illegal smuggling, trade of contraband and contraband again means you know banned items under the wildlife protection act and uh, wildlife and forest crimes again you know includes timber uh, and anything it could include sand because sand is a very important component of nesting for crocodiles and turtles so mining of sand which is used for construction and roads etc from protected areas is also a, a wildlife crime so very briefly again, wildlife crime refers to the taking, trading, supplying, selling and trafficking, importing, exporting, smuggling, processing, possessing, obtaining and consumption of wild fauna and flora. It includes timber and other forest producers and if it's in violation with Indian laws and international laws as well. And uh, traffic has declared wildlife crimes to be the fourth largest transactional transnational criminal activity in the world. So you, you can imagine what we're talking about today, wildlife crime is at one of the highest levels of trafficking. So you have narcotics, gun running, human trafficking, and that's the same level that wildlife trafficking is at. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. What we might see as just a man selling totas or koi sapera, you know, some snake charmers using a little, uh, a few snakes, or somebody selling turtles. It's not just that, that's just what you see at the surface, but when you go deep, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that we've all got to work towards to uh, help address. Just a few examples for those who might already not be familiar, but I, I'm sure most of you are. But so killing, hunting, capturing, and poaching of wild animals, trafficking and trading, selling, trapping of birds, netting of birds, illegal, uh, ex uh, trapping of wild, wild uh, pets in terms of you know birds, reptiles, mammals, for sale within India, which uh, which are listed in the Wildlife Protection Act, that is completely legal. Poisoning and sna and snaring and trapping any wild animals, uh, marine animals like sharks and and other fish that are protected under the law capturing those, eating those, things like that. Harassment or injury to any wild animal also is a part of wildlife crime. Trading in animal skins, fur, hair, body parts, etc. And killing of animals for protecting of crops. So that's very often called as retaliatory killing or crop protection using crude bombs, etc. All of those all come under wildlife crimes. Now this is something many of you may, may or may not have seen. This is a crude jaw trap and a metal jaw trap. It costs maybe between three and 400 rupees to make. It's used, uh, it uses um, discarded automobile spare parts like spring plates of cars and things like that and uh, a chain. And this trap that looks you know, like nothing under the sun can actually kill a, a tiger or a leopard. 
and uh, there are certain communities in India that specialize in setting traps like this for big cats, so tigers, lions, leopards, but also they specialize in killing otters, uh, civets, etc. And once this trap is set, then and, and it actually shuts down on the foot of the animal, and there's no way that animal can get out. Either it has to bite its own leg off and get, a, get away, and then will die of septicemia probably, or it screams out loudly in pain, and the ho poachers who are hiding will come, bludgeon it to death, and kill it, and then take the carcass away. And uh, a lot of these poachers or wildlife criminals have the expertise of knowing where to set these traps. So if you ever see something like this, you need to alert the authorities immediately um, so that they can take action against the people trying to um, harm wildlife. Here's another example of the same jaw trap. This is a smaller trap that's used for smaller wildlife like jackals, civets, otters, etc. So these are lethal um, hunting devices that are used. They'll just basically fracture, break uh, the leg of the animal if it, if it puts its leg in there. And these are concealed under the soil. So you can't actually see this when it's set in the ground. And animals will sometimes die of starvation if they're trapped and the poacher doesn't come back to check it. Otherwise, um, he will probably dispatch the animal very quickly. Now, here's a photo of a tiger. On the left side, what you see is the photo of a tiger with its left paw trapped inside the jaw trap. Now, thankfully, this tiger did not die. It wasn't killed because the forest authorities were able to be alerted. And they went and the animal was tranquilized, rescued. But you can see in the photo on the right hand side that a big portion of its leg, the paw, is missing. And that's because it, ha it had to be amputated off. It was damaged permanently because of the jaw trap. And that animal can never be released in the wild and can never survive on its own. So this kind of permanent handicap and damage is, is caused by jaw traps if they've already not killed the animal. So uh, some of the examples that I'd like to share with you is again, sloth bear cubs that uh, have been poached for you know decades and decades in order to feed an industry in India that was called the dancing bear industry for a very long time. It went on for 400 years, but thankfully, um, the organization that I represent, Wildlife SOS, was able to work since 1995 in collaboration with the Forest Department, the Government of India, the Ministry of Environment and Forests, and several committed forest officers to work across the country and help rehabilitate the community that was involved in exploiting those bears and rescue all of those bears. But just to tell you, there are five or six agencies that work very closely to enforce wildlife crime and implement the Wildlife Protection Act. And they're primarily the forest department, the police in every state, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, which is one national body. The Ministry of Environment and Forests, of course, is an overarching body that monitors both the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau as well as the other state uh, government departments. But you also have um, organizations like Traffic International, Traffic India, and of course, several NGOs like Wildlife SOS, and there are other organizations like WWF, WPSI, uh, et cetera, who are involved in helping to track, gather intelligence, and ensure the protection of wildlife. Of course, each and every one of you, as citizens of this country, have a responsibility as well to help protect wildlife, so everybody can get involved and play a, play a big part. Now, very briefly, I'd like to say what uh, I introduced the sloth bear to you. This is an incredible species of bear. It's only found in the Indian subcontinent. Of course, we have one subspecies in Sri Lanka, but that's it. And uh, yes, we have a small spillover into Nepal. But this is an incredible bear. It's small. It's not a very large bear, but it is a very, it, it has an incredible personality, you know, a big personality in a very small body. It's a very protective bear, will fight tigers easily to protect its offspring and uh, the scientific name is Millersus ursinus and most of you might have spotted this if you've ever gone on safari in Vrantambor National Park or any of our, our national parks in southern India or in uh, central India. So um, this species has been unfortunately persecuted for a very very long time and these bears have learned to coexist 
around human populations. So very often in states like Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Telangana, as well as Andhra Pradesh, there is a lot of conflict with these species, even in Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. And uh, they, they live very close to human habitation. People don't realize that these bears are there. They come upon them and it causes a lot of um, conflict. But this species also, they, their gallbladder, bile, uh, bones, hair, teeth, etc. are unfortunately used in trade. So going back to the dancing bear practice, so this is the practice I was talking about. These bear cubs were poached from the wild as young uh, cubs of a few weeks old. The mother was killed, obviously, in order for the poachers to remove these bears. And then they would uh, put them through a very gory process uh, where they would, uh, I think I have some photos in, in here about how the bear cubs are trained. But basically, wildlife officers worked with this community called the Kalandars. These were a, a nomadic community that uh, continued to exist across India and uh, worked with about 3,000 families, helped them find alternative livelihood, as well as encourage them to willingly and voluntarily surrender their bears to the forest departments across India. And Wildlife SOS established four rescue centers. You can all go to our website, wildlifesos.org, and visit uh, and see what kind of centers we run. And some of you may have already visited our centers. You can see these rehabilitated bears housed at these facilities. Several of our staff, about 40% of our staff uh, at Wildlife SOS are also recruited from these communities, so we give them a chance to reform themselves as well. But while working with any community, we also address you know, women empowerment, community upliftment, healthcare and education, so we ensure that their future generations don't have to go back to exploiting wildlife or getting involved in wildlife poaching or wildlife crime, so the children can get a decent education and move on in their lives and become engineers, doctors, find other vocations so they don't have to go in the way that their forefathers proceeded. So yeah, here are the photos I was referring to earlier. On the left you see baby bears, so bear cubs typically between 6 to 15 weeks, which are being displayed in an undercover, underground black market near Kanpur, uh, which these cubs were for sale, and so Kalandars and other people from other communities could come, select these cubs and buy them for the price from the poachers. And then uh, the photo you see on the right are the teeth and the claws of these sloth bears that uh, are in trade. Of course, we are moving on, segueing into other species, uh, which are sadly involved in wildlife crime. So snakes. Now the photo that you see over there is not a real photo. It's a photo of a rat snake which has had the person who was handling the rat snake has made holes and stuck those uh, bristles or hair into it. So rat snakes have scales. All snakes have scales. They do not have fur or hair on them ever. And so these are and these uh, reptiles are poached. And again, they're protected under the Wildlife Protection Act. But um, snake charmers across India, unfortunately, use these snakes. Although it's a band, they could be jailed for anywhere from three to seven years if they are arrested and convicted of this crime. But very often they get away uh, because of the, of the sympathy of the enforcement authorities sometimes, or they just, you know, uh, or they just, you know, kind of escape at that point of time. But, um, so you may have seen the videos or photos of snake charmers using a flute. So snakes are deaf, they don't have ears. So this should give you an idea that, you know, snakes are not following the flute by any chance. The flute is to fool the human beings and the audience who gather around the snake charmer. And so there are a lot of myths that the snake charmers build around snakes, you know, two-headed snakes, snakes with hair, snakes who follow the flute, etc. So this is something that is a very big part of uh, wildlife crime in India and something that we all have to tackle uh, actively. Again, um, wildlife as well as works with enforcement authorities to actively track down and help address the poaching of snakes as well as other species. But uh, poaching of snakes is a huge problem in India. And a lot of snakes, as you can see here, I'm not sure if all of you can see, pay attention to the face of the snake just below the eye. You can see a piece of rope 
that is a rope that has actually stitched the mouth together. Imagine your mouth being stitched up, your lower jaw and your upper jaw being stitched together just so you don't, you know, the man who's handling the snake does not get bitten. So the snake's mouths are stitched up and then they are kept so they get dehydrated eventually in about in a few days. And then once they die, they, they are skinned. The skin is then sold. It goes into wildlife trade and then the bodies are discarded. All the bones, etc., are sometimes used. So this is the dreadful condition that wildlife SOS very often find snakes and we try to rescue them and rehabilitate them. It's not possible very often. They don't survive if they are in bad shape. Here are some photos that you can see of uh, snake charmers displaying uh, snakes. And once they're rescued, what kind of containers we have to keep them in, rehydrate them, treat them before we can release them. Moving on to other examples of wildlife crime. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, some of you may have followed this story of um, an elephant in Kerala a few months ago that was killed uh, because she ate a fruit that was kept on the side of a field with an explosive inside it. And that is a technique that many farmers and other um, poachers use to dispatch wild animals. So. Uh, a bomb, an explosive, with packed with nails and metal pieces, a shrapnel is is packed inside a food item like a papaya or a watermelon, and then that's kept in a place, primarily for wild boar or other animals that farmers think are either dangerous for their crops, or the intention is to kill something for the pot or for for wildlife uh, trade, and then animals like sloth bears, the photo on the left or elephants, the photo on the right. Uh, in, in the right, you can actually see the entire mouth missing. The mouth has been blown off when the bomb exploded inside its mouth, when the elephant bit down into the thing. And the unfortunate thing with both these cases are the elephant was pregnant in the photo inset that you see is the fetus that was found inside her carcass. And the sloth bear on the left was also pregnant when she was killed. So it, it decimates not just the animal, but also a possible future generation when these things happen. Also moving on uh, to other species, tigers are very actively poached. So poaching of tigers is something that we have to address. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you know this, but you know, tiger skin, bones, uh, blood, tiger penis soup is a big delicacy in, in China and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, there's a lot of uh, myths um, surrounding the tiger and they believe that everything from a whisker to the blood uh, and every body part of the tiger is used as an aphrodisiac or treatments in Chinese traditional medicine but this is not scientifically proven there are much better uh, uh, chemical and scientific alternatives instead of um, using tigers so this is a problem that our tigers face as an active threat from this uh, traditional Chinese medicine industry sadly. So uh, Wildlife SOS actively runs an anti-poaching unit and our unit has informers. A lot of our informers are reformed poachers who we have managed to, you know, they've sent, served their jail sentence, they've come out and then we've given them a chance to reform themselves and work with us because they already know how the industry works. So they help us track down uh, wildlife traffickers, they go in as decoys, gather intelligence and then we share that intelligence with institutions or departments like the forest department, the police, or the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. And we work in liaison with them, in collaboration with them to try and carry out either the sting operation or the raid and uh, help with um, you know, rescuing wildlife if it's live or assist with confiscation of the contraband. Uh, and also Wildlife SOS has a legal division which assists with prosecution as well. Uh, after the case is you know taken to court because our while our laws are one of the best in the world the wildlife protection act of 1972 in india is something that is really uh, a very visionary and um, incredible law but the implementation of the same on the ground leaves a lot to be desired for and for that reason there is a lot of uh, gap between the actual prosecution and, and what happens on the ground. So wildlife criminals sadly get away uh, by getting out on bail and then you know there's a delay, the evidence disappears, etc. So you'd all be disappointed to know that the 
conviction rate for wildlife crimes in India is a dismal 0.01%. Um, so we've all got to work towards that. And for that, we need you know, uh, active um, involvement with the judiciary, with the enforcement organizations, and with citizens. Each one of you can play a role in changing that conviction rate and being more effective. Oh, this is one of the cases uh, not too long ago, just a couple of years ago, there were these, uh, these two people, like I was mentioning, they are from a community who specialize in killing tigers. And sadly, we found out that this tiger was killed from Corbett National Park. And uh, you can see the skin. And then right behind on the photo, further up in the center, you can see all the bones. And they were still curing this when they were trying to move this skeleton and the skin and the contraband to another location and so the police and the forest department uh, worked with us on the seizure and uh, in fact the STF the special task force of the police uh, uh, put together two teams just to help us nab these guys and uh, it was a very sad thing so while you might have success in uh, addressing you know a case like this but it's very sad and it's very emotional when you see that a uh, beautiful animal like this has been decimated just because of uh, human greed and, and for some money. So this case is still in court, but of course the offenders have been able to get bail and you know it will take several years before uh, conviction is uh, achieved. Of course, I mentioned to you about the pangolins and they are sadly the world's most trafficked animal. In fact, there are some dishes in China that have unborn fetuses of, of pangolin that are used and and of course they are boiled and eaten and, and stuff like that so you can imagine what um, th a threat the whole uh, population of pangolins face everywhere around the world so these are some of the animals that we have been able to rescue at wildlife sos and whenever we've got intelligence we've been able to intervene rescue these animals and try and put them back in the wild uh, of course under the um, under the guidance of the forest department at that point Uh, here's a pangolin being released. I think uh, this is not a video, sorry. But basically, um, we try and use this kind of a model where we place the pangolin in a safe place and it gets out and then walks away, finds its own space in safe, suitable habitat in a protected area. So these are other uh, cases where we've been able to prevent wildlife crime when our team has been able to get somewhere. Uh, on the photo on the left is a common sand boa or a Russell's boa that was rescued and then released back. But in some cases, when you don't respond on time and rescue that animal and move it to safety, then the opportunity for a wildlife crime getting perpetrated occurs. And that's what we try to uh, ensure that we can avoid. The photo on the right, is the Delhi Metro. So this was at the metro station where one of these kites, the black kites, hit the electric line, landed down in the metro. Thankfully, the metro authorities were very, very cooperative and they contacted us immediately and our team was able to get there, move that bird to safety before something else could happen. Now we have four species of bears in India. This is one of the, one of the four species. I'd like to tell you which the four species are. We have sloth bears, Asiatic black bears, the one in this photo over here. We also have sun bears found in the northeast area bordering Myanmar. And we also have Himalayan brown bears, which are akin to European brown bears, upper in the upper reaches of the Himalayas. And so we have a wildlife resource as a project where we are working to prevent wildlife crime, but also conserve the species of Asiatic black bears in Jammu and Kashmir and brown bears now. So we have two orphanages that we uh, run in Dachi Gam and Pahalgam of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, we not just address human wildlife conflict, human bear conflict, but also our team there uh, has been very active in helping people with leopards, snakes, etc. Again, this species is also protected under the Wildlife Protection Act. We also um, run a, a leopard conservation project. So Leopards, again, you know, are one of the most trafficked species. Uh, they're found 
in, in several continents, but uh, the Indian leopard, um, sadly, while it is a very successful predator, it has succeeded in adapting to human infiltration because human beings have kind of taken over the landscape and largely leopards have learned to survive in a human dominated landscape. And our uh, rescue center that we run, the Wildlife SOS Leopard Rescue Center is established in Maharashtra, very close to Pune. Um, and it's been functioning for you know over uh, 10 to 15 years, but we run this in collaboration with the forest department again. And over here, we are not just trying to prevent people from persecuting these leopards or killing them or hunting them, but we're also trying to teach the local communities on how they can coexist and survive with uh, the leopard in the same landscape. So we are teaching them avoidance behavior. We also help them rescue leopard cubs. And I think in the past, we've rescued over 60 leopard cubs <coughs> and successfully reunited these cubs back with their mothers. So this landscape also has a lot of open wells. So these leopards fall into these wells and we've got to rescue them. In some cases, we before we can get there, the leopard is already drowned or has died. And uh, so that, that's very challenging. Currently, we have about 32 leopards at our rescue center in Maharashtra. So these are rusty spotted cats that you see in this uh, photo. And this is one of the wells that I was talking to you about. They are really deep, large, sometimes spanning two to three acres at the, as a diameter and uh, they fall inside and they're not able to get back. The cubs starve while waiting for the mother. The mother dies because she drowns in the well, so it, it can be very challenging. But in many cases, we've been successfully able to get these leopards out, thereby putting the leopard back in the landscape wherever possible. So moving on, again, star tortoise. This is another huge problem. So this species is largely poached for the pet trade. So a lot of people like to keep tortoises and the Indian starback tortoise or the star tortoise is again uh, an endangered species protected under the law. It's also listed under CITES for one of the most trafficked species of tortoises. And uh, wildlife officers had an opportunity to intervene quite extensively with this particular species because we were approached by uh, Singapore authorities who have been confiscating star tortoise consignments being smuggled into Singapore from India. So when we went into the history of that, we found that they were consignments marked as fresh vegetables or fresh chilies or something like that, which were being sent to Singapore from Bangalore and of course from other parts of India as well. And then if the authorities in Singapore would conf confiscate that consignment, then they would you know, keep them there. So wildlife officers work closely with a local organization in Singapore called Acres, but also with the Singapore authorities. And we were able to facilitate repatriation uh, of the species. So we were able to get about 152 um, specimens back. Some of them were sick and th they couldn't be transported, but the ones that were in good shape. So we wildlife officers had to send a team across. It is extensive. Uh, it, it requires extensive paperwork and a lot of perseverance and just non-stop patience. So it took us a long time to get all the paperwork done, uh, go to Singapore, examine the animals, make sure they were safe, healthy to transport back, get the paperwork cleared over there. And then all the CITES permits from India, the Ministry of Envi Environment and Forest approved all the paperwork. And then finally, we were able to even get Singapore Airlines to donate the cargo for uh, sending all these tortoises back to India. So they were flown back and then we were able to work with the local authorities, the forest department and the chief file have ordered to place these tortoises back in firstly in a quarantine area because you've got to make sure disease protocols are followed. And then it took a long time for these tortoises to readapt to the vegetation. So that's another thing we've got to keep in mind when you intervene in wildlife crime, you also have to understand that a conservation component comes in. You've got to make sure that this, this species, they've been moved from a, play, a place where their natural habitat is a dry scrub jungle. So that's the kind of vegetation they've been feeding on. But they've then moved to Singapore, which is a very moist place. The moisture level is, is very, very different. The, the kind of vegetation they get is very different. 
and then to bring them back you've got to get these animals readapted to the local vegetation and then that has to be done gradually inside a pen where you can monitor them and then we what you see on this tortoise do you see a black you see two or three black dots so that's actually an antenna so we put uh, radio transmitters on these tortoises and you see a number 56 on this so we were able to tag every tortoise put a radio transmitter on some of them and then release them so that we could monitor and track these animals every single day and see what the rate of success is so wildlife crime also requires intervention to not just eradicate crime at, uh, address it enforce the law implement the laws but also try and rehabilitate these animals which requires which are a whole new ball game altogether and then uh, again we're talking about when we talk about pet trade you're talking about a lot of birds remember we're not talking exotic birds we're not talking about species that are captive bred we're not talking about species that have been imported from other countries we're talking about species that live in india and free range in the wild around us so like this is a, these are species these are munias that are found in india finches munias ring-necked parakeets indian hornbills these are the species we need to worry about and not exotic uh, pets but the exotic pet trade sometimes encourages local people to get local species because they're cheaper but you know what we need to focus on is to prevent indian wild animals birds or reptiles getting sucked up into the pet trade so uh, here what you see is a photo of animals birds and amphibians that were confiscated from a pet trader who was selling these and here these are not exotic animals or birds these are local species star tortoise ring-necked parakeets is what i see in these in these photos and you can see them as well owls uh, are, are also another species francolins or partridges munias bayas etc are all traded <coughs> moving on to elephant conservation program uh, are, is everybody able to hear me clearly uh, dr shruti uh, and dr ulas any any problems with the communication so far am i going no, too fast sir, or slow? absolutely clear you may go ahead Thank you. And are we getting questions into the yes, chat box? Sir, we have a lot of questions to you. Excellent. Um, because I, I see I have 17 minutes and 45 seconds left. So I just want to pace myself to make sure that we have enough time for question and answers. Thank you, sir. All right. Moving on to the elephants. Now, you know, uh, India has, um, has a very close relationship with elephants from time immemorial. You know, they're a part of our culture. They've been involved in battles and wars in the past. Uh, gods are depicted on top of elephants. Elephants are prey to, and Ganesh is our, uh, is our big elephant god. So not only is it important for uh, us, uh, elephants are also, uh, you know, a really important species for India. Not only are they endangered, but they're also, um, they play a huge role in managing the forests of India, they actually actively change the architecture of our forests as they clean trees, break trees, move the vegetation, things grow and, and come back. So they play a very important role ecologically as well. So you'd all be shocked to know that the Indian population of Asian elephants has lost 98% of its wild Asian elephants um, in I mean, ar around the world, we've lost it because India only has 22,000 to 24,000 elephants left. And we had about a million elephants just 100 years ago. So 10 decades ago, we had a million elephants. And now, 10 decades later, we have 2% of what was 1 million. So you can imagine, you know, what, what we've lost. So uh, this is the pace of loss in just 10 decades. So you can imagine what is going to happen in the future if we don't do something um, seriously. Now, as I said, you know, uh, Lord Ganesh is some, some, someone we pray to. A lot of Indians do that. Uh, but also, one of the reasons that elephants are trafficked and are one of the biggest species in wildlife trade 
is because they used extensively in um, temples, processions, etc. And um, you, what you see on the photo on the left is a boy being blessed by an elephant. Uh, but also, not just is there illegal trafficking of elephants, but also there's a lot of abuse and cruelty and torture for these wild animals that are protected under our laws. So the man you see sitting next to the foot, right foot of the elephant has got a metal rod in his hand. And that is called a bull hook. And he's using the sharp end of that to control the elephant. And that is how elephants are trained traditionally uh, across India. So I, I will not play you videos and cause you um, trauma to watch these videos, but I'm going to show you some screenshots. Uh, I'm not sure if some of these videos will play, but this is a screenshot or a grab, a video grab of a baby elephant being captured in the wild. And this is the process that poachers use to capture baby elephants or elephant calves from a herd. So, um, sorry about that, just a second. Yeah, um, so typically elephants live in herds. They're a very social species and the herd involving the females, the cow, cow elephants as we call them, um, the mother of the calf, the aunts, they all protect these calves within the herd. And when they're moving together, what these poachers do is they either use pit traps or they use explosives to frighten the herd. When the herd moves fast, the calves can't keep pace with them and then they capture them. These elephant calves are then removed and then subjected to a very gruesome, barbaric training process where they're beaten, brutalized, starved, till the elephant learns, the spirit is broken of that elephant, and then it learns that, okay, I've got to listen to the, the human being who's torturing me, otherwise I'm not gonna get food and I'm going to be in pain constantly. And that's how elephants are trained to give rights to people. So these elephants that you see, this is a photo from Jaipur, uh, and the, these are elephants that are giving rights to tourists. Each of these elephants that you see have been taken from the wild. And then once they're trained, this is what they become. So this is a photo in, taken from Kerala where elephants are used for religious ceremonies. Again, all of these bull elephants that you see uh, are taken from the wild. And uh, bull elephants typically live solitarily in the wild. They do not stay next to each other and they, uh, they all have a lot of testosterone so they get aggressive with each other. And bulls also go through a, a period of must where they, um, you know, they have this uh, secretion from the temple glands and the musk glands in the temples and then they can go violent. There are multiple incidents of uh, bull elephants going crazy, running amok and killing people, including their own handler, their own mahout. Uh, so you can imagine what you're seeing, this image that you see right in front of you is a time bomb waiting to explode because you can imagine those thousands of people in front of all of these bull elephants you know, who are scared, they're probably terrified by the crowd being, ch but each of these elephants is tied up with spiked shackles and they've got a spear next to it. So the animal is only staying there quietly because it's, you know, in pain and is uncomfortable and knows that it'll get into trouble and a lot of suffering if it misbehaves. These are the tools that are used to train elephants. And uh, the spiked bracelets or the shackles that you see, those are about two inch long spikes and they are tied up tightly. So they em get embedded into the leg of the elephant. And so you can imagine wearing this bracelet continuously with you know, these things piercing into your leg. So the animal is in constant pain. So the, so the wild elephant, which would typically want to do wild behavior is contained, constrained, restrained and forced to behave uh, as per the requirement of the person who holds it in captivity through using these tools. And what you see on the left are spears and a bull hook. So this is how typically wild animals are controlled. So this is, of course, a part of wildlife crime because not only has the animal been taken away from its natural habitat, possibly legally, but it's also uh, being abused in this manner. So moving on to the conservation component for elephants, you know, wildlife has 
realized that one of the big issues that uh, our enforcement agencies face to protect elephants and to conserve elephants is um, the problem of not being able to house wild elephants that have been confiscated or elephants that have been confiscated or seized from traders. So if an illegal trafficker is moving an elephant and the forest department swoops down, gets information, is able to take action and they confiscate that elephant, there, there is no real place to take that elephant to. They can either move it to the zoo or you know, to a forest camp, but that causes a lot of inconvenience because those places may not have the ability to look after an elephant that is already you know, injured, blind, requires a lot of medical care. And uh, because of that, the laws, then um, the owner can go to the court and request for temporary custody of these elephants and the forest department is then forced to give the owner temporary custody of the elephant, which is, which basically amounts to the perpetrator getting the victim back in his custody. And so to address that and to, you know, help with implementation of the laws in India, Wildlife Service established the Elephant Conservation and Care Center in 2010. So we also have India's first elephant hospital over there. This is located in Mathura, about uh, 45 minutes from the Taj Mahal or about two and a half hours from Delhi. The goal is also to create a model center that can function um, in a way that will work as a platform for training other people, professionals interested in protection and preservation and conservation of elephants, but also uh, share knowledge. This is a photo of our elephant hospital. It's about 12,000 square feet. The photo of our elephant ambulance is right on the, on the right side, uh, standing outside the elephant uh, hospital. And the goal is to share knowledge with every, anybody who wants to learn about protection and conservation of elephants. And so we do workshops at this hospital and at our conservation center where people can come and attend to um, you know, courses where they learn about protection and conservation of elephants. And we also have students from the Wildlife Institute of India and several forest departments coming in there for, for training as well. So this is the ambulance that I was referring to earlier. This is a specialized ambulance. This is probably only the only one of its kind in India because it had to be designed specifically, which accommodates the length of an elephant. It has inbuilt showers to cool down the elephant. It also has a cabin where uh, two veterinarians and four or five staff can travel with the elephant while monitoring the elephant. They can carry their own drugs. They have a little place where they can wash their hands if they are administering medicines and things like that. They can also feed the elephant. It's got a, so it's powered by both solar and a, a diesel generator and uh, has a cabin for uh, nearly 10 people to travel if they're going on a rescue or an intervention. I already explained all of these things to you, but basically this is what the ambulance contains. It has a hydraulic ramp, uh, showers, food bins, generator, wet preparation area, water storage, elephant access from cabin, barriers for the elephant, video cameras to monitor the movement of the elephant, cell phone chargers, climate control, air conditioning on the inside, crew bunks, observation window. So it kind of gives you an idea of you know, what the ambulance has. So uh, typically moving forward, th this is just one case I'd like to share with you quickly. Uh, so this is one of our recent rescues called Emma. So we got intelligence that she was being trafficked. So typically the forest department did the case. We were able to intervene, rescue this elephant with the active support, guidance and cooperation of the forest department. Uh, then once she was on the uh, truck, on the ambulance being moved, she starts getting medical treatment. And then once she reaches our hospital, we have to give special pillows for these elephants if they're very weak and frail and fragile, then we have to you know, provide them specialized areas. The flooring that you see where this elephant is lying down, that's a rubberized flooring. The entire area is uh, rubberized with a thick rubber mat so the elephant doesn't feel um, you know, the concrete. And then the photo on the right indicates the kind of pebbles and foreign objects that we had to extract from her feet. And then of course, you know, eventually all of our elephants get an opportunity to display wild behavior. This is, a, this is the river Yamuna, which is beside our rescue center, where the elephants can go out and uh, get a chance to be elephants in, in a true way. 
of course uh, every elephant needs to be uh, provided a nutritious and healthy diet so an important part of providing care for rescue rescued elephants which have been confiscated or seized is to ensure that the nutrition that is required is provided in the past the animals that have been kept in captivity usually suffer a lot of malnutrition they just get given you know old uh, dry grass or something like that but what is required is that we need to ensure that they have fresh fruits green fodder continuous supply of drinking water as well as vegetables to eat in addition to i mean we should basically provide 3 to 400 kilos per day per elephant and that's what we need to do another uh, part of elephant conservation um, which wildlife Service is involved in is the human elephant conflict mitigation so there's a lot of human elephant conflict also known as hec that goes along across india in several states and this particular one is in chhattisgarh where uh, wildlife Service is working with the state forest department of chhattisgarh to address this with the local communities the herd photo that you see on the left side is a herd that entered chhattisgarh from orissa because of a coal mine that was uh, that was excavated over there and that coal mine destroyed their immediate habitat and their uh, migratory route uh, that caused a problem for the elephants natural movement so they ended up moving in a different direction and entered chhattisgarh sadly chhattisgarh the local community the local people didn't know how to coexist with elephants so they were accidentally getting cl too close to the elephants they didn't know avoidance behavior they were getting injured they were um, human deaths i think when we got involved they were we had received a report of 90 human deaths just from um, wild elephants and so we realized that we've got to address this because an important part of preventing wildlife crime and conservation is to ensure that you understand the problems involved in this and is crime being committed because pe local people don't have a choice is it being committed because people people's lives are at stake so that is an important part of understanding so when we did our research in the local area we found out that local people were not aware of how to deal with this and they also didn't have any solutions so one of the things wildlife was did was to get involved with the local community we then imported some callers radio callers with the help of the government and uh, this what you see here is the radio collaring process of a wild female elephant a matriarch which leads the entire herd so we were able to put a global positioning system installed inside the collar the photo on the right shows you the collar and that black gray box that you see is the global positioning system uh, and it has a weight at the bottom a counterweight that is put around the collar of this elephant this is a it's not an easy process you know it it's not like we just go there and say kitty 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 come here and we collar the elephant it's a very very risky process because you've got to track the herd of elephants for weeks and weeks and weeks on foot so that is very dangerous and then uh, of course all our staff are insured but we still need to make sure they are safe and they don't get you know trampled or killed by these elephants but then once you track the elephant then you have to use a tranquilizing gun with a very carefully calibrated dose of tranquilizer which our veterinarians use to tranquilize one elephant which is a matriarch you've got to identify the ma matriarch and then tranquilize her and then you only got to make sure that she gets a dosage which gives you standing sedation and not she doesn't fall down that makes it very difficult so this is a, an elephant that is sedated but she can't move and she hasn't fallen down so you cover her you blindfold her so she doesn't get excited by the visual stimuli set up the collar check it and then release her <coughs> and once this is done we can then track this elephant and uh, you you can see in this previous photo so imagine this entire herd is following this matriarch and then once you have the matriarch collared you can track the movement of the elephants all through <coughs> moving forward and what we've done is establish something called an early warning alert system in chhattisgarh uh, again in collaboration with the forest department so every time we get a reading of where that elephant is moving that message is then transmitted to the forest department and through radio to all of the local communities. So they get to know on WhatsApp groups which direction that elephant herd is moving in and the local community can then be alert that, okay, this, this herd is now moving two kilometers to near our village. So let's all get ready. So they all get ready, come outside and they make 
we teach them avoidance behavior in the communication and education awareness programs that we do with the local community. So they get out, you know, make a lot of noise, etc. So the elephant herd then doesn't want to go in that direction. It moves away and goes off into the forest instead of going into the crop areas. So that way we prevent human elephant conflict, but we're also able to mitigate the escalation that could have happened there. And we protect human lives and also lives of elephants, but also property. So our goal is to just create a better life for all elephants as well. And just one thing I quickly wanted to bring up, uh, along with wildlife crime, one of the reasons elephants are poached is for the tourism industry. <coughs> it's sad that uh, my one hour is over, so I'll quickly try and finish after this. So one of the reasons that um, illegal trafficking of elephants happen, where you know documents are forged, elephants don't, don't match, you know, how old they are in the documents and all that indicates that there is a lot of trafficking of elephants. And the dark truth behind elephant rides that all of you may not be aware of is that every single elephant that you see giving a ride to a tourist or in a temple or in a procession or in a ceremony, remember it's been taken from the wild and it has been poached. And there is a lot of, uh, you know, ugly truth that people don't want you to know. So we've been, uh, we've got this, uh, website called refuse to ride.org so please feel free to go and check out that website it'll give you a lot of knowledge it'll empower you with the right information and then you should uh, feel free to sign the petition if you can because it helps create uh, traction with the authorities about what needs to be done and so the if tourists became aware and conscious then you know this this demand for rights is what is driving poaching of elephant calves. So we've got to make that connection and understand that. So I would encourage all of you to uh, please visit the wildlifeswiss.org website as well as the refuse to ride.org website to see it. And last of all, if any of you would like to know more about the work that we do actively, uh, you can uh, watch a program called uh, India's, India's Jungle Heroes or Jungle Animal Rescue. It's got different names in different countries, but this is a six series episode, six episode series on National Geographic uh, and also on Nat Geo Wild uh, called India's Jungle Heroes. It has six, um, you know, one hour episodes where Wildlife SOS is actively dealing with wildlife crime and wildlife conservation. So this is something you, if you are interested, this is something you could watch. It's also available on Hotstar. And I would request my colleague Shirina and Mahima to post the link on Hotstar so all of you can take a chance to look at it. But also the um, also feel free to write any any time you want. If you have any questions, uh, even after after this webinar, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our email is uh, info at wildlifesos.org, and you can um, also send emails to Karthik at wildlifesos.org or Shirina at wildlifesos.org with your question or your comment um, so that we can connect with you and uh, get back to you with the answers and we will answer every single question uh, without fail that you have my assurance so uh, i think uh, dr ulas dr shruti we have 20 minutes left shall i stop screen sharing at this stage yes sir we may proceed for the question answer round. thank you and thank you so much for such an insightful, informative, and such an enlightening session. You're very welcome. Okay, sir. So. so we have a common question posted by Shriyoshi, Mr. Ashish, and Ms. Shalini. So they say that, do you expect wildlife crime to increase in the next few years because of COVID-related economic crisis? Or, and uh, how has India's recent economic condition affected conservation? Do you see it as a source of additional problem? And coming along is the third question. What is causing the recent surge in wildlife crime? As it is seen, it has been increased with a lot of years. So uh, crime, we must remember that, you know, if, if you're all understanding and, uh, you know, understanding of wildlife, of, of crime, criminology, you know, and, and the nature of any crime is that, you know, it's, there's a certain amount of risk and people see it as a quick way to, you know, make quick money or achieve financial goals very quickly, which is why 
there is you know gun running narcotics human trafficking and trafficking of drugs gold anything at all and same thing applies to wildlife as well in most of the cases such as you know uh, drugs or gold um, or you know uh, guns etc there is an there is an investment component so you know people have to have the ability to invest a capital to buy their drugs and then traffic it and then make a profit on it so the there is an investment required and there is a risk required you know that they have to invest with wildlife crime sadly if the communities that are aware of how to do this poaching or hunting then the investment is almost nil it's minuscule and it can it mean it might only cost them maybe 5 or 10000 rupees to kill a tiger but they would earn lakhs if they sold it so there is a certain amount of risk but also that risk gets negated when they know that the conviction rate in wildlife crime is 0.01% whereas conviction rate with you know drugs is is much more severe it's non bailable it's non uh, compoundable drugs or uh, gold and things like that you know they they can't get away like for example look at singapore for example if you have a drug related crime in singapore it's the death penalty <coughs> you absolutely cannot get out of it or in dubai etc but in india you know they they've got to they so criminals look at that very often and uh, yes covid has caused a problem because it has impacted the ability of enforcement officers enforcement agencies to do patrolling to do monitoring the normal way that they used to in the past so that has created you know a sort of a, a a lull in the patrolling and the monitoring of protected areas or wildlife reserves etc and that has created an opportunity for wildlife criminals to take advantage of that lull to intervene and maybe you know kill more animals etc so <coughs> so we've got to uh, be even more alert me even more active uh, engage with organizations like the wildlife crime control bureau uh, wildlife sos the police etc and uh, be very vigilant at any point of time to address it did i answer all your questions uh, shruti yes sir you answered so the Thank next set of questions are asked by mr tarun and ms shanini and they ask that would you like to share the fate of these seized wildlife products how india has been combating of taking care of such products how we should alter people's impression of items made from wildlife you'll have to repeat that question again sorry okay, do you say that yes sir. so the question is would you like to share the fate of the seized wildlife product how india have been combating of taking care of such goods so the seized wildlife products basically you know uh, become evidence in court so they will either uh, remain in an evidence room in the forest department or in uh, uh, in in the wildlife institute of india where they've gone for analysis and uh, basically they are used as referral material that's what happens with seized products seized animals are either released back in the wild or they are they go to rescue centers such as the ones run by wildlife sos uh, uh, does that answer your question yes sir and uh, miss neha asked a very interesting question that what is the procedure for reporting a potential crime related to wildlife in rural and urban areas of india just reach out to the authorities call your nearest forest officer call your nearest uh, police officer go to the police station report it but also put it out on social media so that you know uh, alert the local district magistrate local commissioner the local conservator of forest the local dfo that's the quickest way to do it but also you can reach out to organizations like wildlife sos if you want uh, and we will facilitate you know further information to those uh, officers but the quickest way is your local team over there i hope this answers your question ms neha and mr ashish asked we all know about deep spiritual tradition about the animals being revered in india but we also hear some of very brutal practices how do you and your traditional beliefs affect the situation and prevailing attitude towards animals among the general population of india 
it's a very long question uh, what i say is that you know yes traditional traditionally are you trying to say that traditionally we've been abusing these animals but things should change is i guess that's yes. probably what the person is asking but yes you know traditionally i mean if you look back in history you know none of us had computers or the internet or watches or you know we were all walking barefoot in the forest right but as time moved on we have all modernized so the same way we must move away from <clears throat> traditional beliefs which involve uh, abusing harvesting wild animals if if that's uh, where you're coming from you know it's really important for us to understand that maybe 300 years ago or 500 years ago it was necessary to capture elephants and use them but now we are much wiser we know that you know we have less than 3% protected areas for wildlife in india 3% is all we have left and we have 22000 elephants look at the human population we have crores and crores of people but we only have 22000 people left and if you want any elephants left on this planet on uh, on our surface you know for future generations and it's important for us to understand that protecting wildlife is more important than tradition and uh, you know we've got to understand and move with the time no point in having i mean like you know there there was a old traditional belief where you know women would jump into the pyre of their burning husbands if they died sati but that's not something that's carry, carried on now that's gone it's been abolished and you know it's illegal in fact today child marriages were a part of our tradition but that's that's been abolished it's illegal today so why should we not abolish other traditions that involve abuse of wildlife where it's illegal and it's banned thank you sir mr tarun ask are there any recent technological interventions which are used for solving the purpose of biodiversity conservation a case study as a example would be great if you can throw some insights i gave the case study of the global positioning system used in the radio collar i think that is a very um, apt case study to refer to uh, where technology was used to help address conflict between humans and elephants but also prevent wildlife crime that's one one way of doing it and also radio collars that were used for um for the star tortoises and we use whatsapp in fact extensively to communicate with local communities to address uh, issues of conflict and uh, also uh, you know address wildlife crime cases does that address uh, the question suitably yes sir so a uh, very uh, a unique question which has come to you is is it crime to be non vegetarian not at all that has nothing at all to do that I, we are talking about wildlife crime um, you know we are not talking about it is a crime to eat wild animals yes that i will agree it is if you ate snakes or pangolins or you wanted to eat mongoose or wild boar yes that is a wildlife crime and please do not indulge in that but that does not apply to you know like i said you know domestic animals etc um is it so we have a question so that in many houses people are keeping parrot is a parrot a pet keeping a pet a legal So you are on mute. So can you unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I don't know how I muted myself accidentally. I apologize. So if you're talking about the green ring-necked parakeet, which is called the hara tota, yes, it is illegal. It is protected under the Wildlife Protection Act, and keeping those hara totas or the green ring-necked parakeets or rose-ring parakeets, the scientific name is Cyticula cramerai. Technically, they are they are illegal. so it is not wise to keep them in captivity you could choose to hand them over to a rehabilitation center a rescue center or to your nearest zoo or forest office if the birds are able to fly you could consider releasing them in the presence of a forest officer but please connect with your nearest forest officer so that uh, they can help you with that but yes if they are exotic birds please don't release them those are not covered under the law and it's not illegal to keep exotic birds or 
exotic pets, meaning if they are not listed in the Wildlife Protection Act, but if they are listed in the Wildlife Protection Act and they are indigenous, then they, and they are endangered, and they are Indian species, then you cannot keep them. So Mr. Harsha asked that some educational institutions with institutional museum sometimes try to replace the damaged specimens with the new ones. According to them, it is for educational purposes. Is it a crime? If yes, then what are the regulations to stop this? What are they replacing with the new ones again? The old, uh, the damaged specimens with of the new what? ones. Specimens of what? So the uh, museums of the species. Which museums are we talking the about? The educational museums. No, no, are we talking about wildlife specimens? Uh, I hope, Mr. Uh, yes, sir, the wildlife uh, specimens kept in the institutional museums of the educational institutes. That That is a severe crime, absolutely. They cannot replace old specimens with new ones. If they are procuring new ones from the wild, then you know this should be reported immediately and action should be taken against the museum uh, people. Sometimes the people in the museum might not even know that it's illegal. They might be just telling a vendor that you replace it, it's bad. And the vendor may be indulging in wildlife crime. So it's important for us to you know, bring it immediately to the attention of the authority so it can be looked into. Very often, crime is, is not even known that it's, a crime is being, uh, you know, is, is uh, being occurred. So it's really important for us to do that. Um, thank you, sir. Mr. Indrajit asked that reintroduced leopards or any other wild animal attracts the hunters and the poachers. When they come to know the area where the wild animals are released, how to tackle this problem? Uh, I would say that um, hunters and poachers don't go around to those areas where, uh, you know, animals are released. Animals are released in safe, protected areas always. So, for example, when we were releasing the tortoises or when we were releasing the um, leopards or any other species, we always make sure that they are released in areas where the potential of something, someone coming in and poaching them or hunting them is, is absolutely minimal or there is constant patrolling or, uh, or safety. So that is not a, a big problem. The problem is when there are areas where there is existing poaching that's going on, that needs to be addressed by increasing patrolling, increasing awareness. And, and most of all, most important of all is to report any crime at all that is occurring in those areas to the authorities so action can be taken. If you can arrest even one person, if one man can be arrested and convicted in a village, that news will travel like wildfire and that will work as a way to educate those people over there in that community. And everybody will say, in that village, that man was arrested for poaching a tortoise, so please let's all be very careful. And that sometimes helps incredibly. So it's really important to make good examples and case studies in every area wherever there is a problem with wildlife protection. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ronak asked, from your perspective, how reluctant are the NGOs and government agencies while sharing the data publicly? I would say they would share the data. I mean, if, if the data is useful, yes. Uh, but if you're talking about data of number of animals that have been killed, etc., all that is available publicly. In, in fact, uh, you know, most of this information is available if you put RTIs in. Every forest department will share how many people were killed, what amount was paid as compensation, how many leopards were killed, how many leopards were poached. All that information, if it's recorded, it will be available. So I, I would say if you follow due process, you can get all of this information. Thank you, sir. Ms. Ambika asked that uh, such uh, crimes happening in front of people and these traditional practices which treat the animals like this is still happening. Can anyone from other part of the country complain to take action against such practices? How come there is no action under the law? There is action being taken. Like I said, you know, I showed you photos and instances of action being taken, but action is not being taken because people like us are watching it and not reporting it. So we can increase action if there is more awareness. So this process that the, uh, this opportunity here today that Dr. Ulaz and Shruti have given us to interact is a process of creating, expanding awareness. And all of you are now no longer ignorant about this. So all of you can go out there, take action, 
against snake charmers, anybody exploiting wildlife, report it to the forest officer, and then that will encourage the authorities to take action. And anybody can complain. Anybody in India can complain about any state, any uh, crime being perpetrated in any part of the country. And I encourage all of you to please move forward and, and uh, take action. Mr. Nebin asks, South Indian farmers use explosive covered in meat or fruits just to scare away or kill wild boars, which attack the farms. Sometimes they also use electrocuted fencing to prevent wild animals from entering their farms. How far such acts are justifiable? And do they have any other alternatives to safeguard their farm from not harming the wildlife animals? Yes, there are humane, scientific, safe and clever technology involving uh, options that are available to safeguard farms. But the use of electric lines to electrocute animals and the use of crude bombs to drive away or scare uh, um, w wild animals from their crops is illegal, it's banned, it's unethical, immoral and dangerous and must not be resorted to under any circumstances because they, the farmer who's planting this bomb is not going to be able to ensure that only a wild boar will eat that. He cannot stop a pangolin or, um, you know, or a civet cat or an elephant or a sloth bear or a leopard from eating it or attempting to eat it. So, and, and electrocution, there are so many examples in Bangalore. I grew up in Bangalore. And there are so many examples where in Bangalore, farmers would go and pull the electric line, the, uh, you know, 11,000 volt electric line connected to their fence to keep elephants away. <clears throat> but they lost their own family member because the man didn't know there was an electric line. He touched the fence <clears throat> and he was killed. There are many instances of other, of unintentional people and animals being killed by such solutions. So this is the worst thing you can do. It is a heinous crime to, um, to try any of these methods to protect your crop. That is not the way to protect your crop. Not only that, it's important for you to understand that if there is any crop depredation by wild animals, the forest department has a budget to give to the farmer. So if the farmer simply reports it and says, three acres of my 10 acre field was damaged by wild boar, the ranger will come study the thing. He will make a calculation and pay the farmer. The farmer will get crop compensation from the state forest department and the government has crores of rupees set aside only for crop compensation so they farmers don't need to take law into their hands they don't need to try and kill uh, animals or frighten animals or pull electric lines down electrocute animals or bomb them in order to protect the crops at all also there are very uh, good opportunities where horticulture and agriculture uh, training sessions are conducted. So, for example, if there is a field where they're only growing potatoes and wild boar like potatoes, so the farmer finds that all the potatoes are being eaten up by the wild boar, he can change his cropping pattern or he can invest in some kind of solar powered electric fencing, which is humane, which will keep the wild boar out, but will not kill them. It, it works on a different technology. That's a, a New Zealand based technology and it's very affordable, mm -hmm. very, very cheap very affordable, works on solar energy and keeps wild boar away. Alternatively, he could even look at changing his crop pattern so he can grow flowers or rosemary. You know, wild boar are not interested in herbs. They're looking for tubers because they want to dig up the tubers and eat them. They're looking for high carbohydrate tubers. So if he grew rosemary or lemongrass, you know, those are high value cash crops and he would earn five times the price instead of selling potatoes. So those are the things that farmers can and look at. I hope I have answered that question uh, substantially. Yes, sir, you have answered. And uh, thank you so much. We have taken all the note of the questions of all the participants and we will be definitely addressing them and emailing to sir. And since we have the next fourth shit fourth session lined up at 5 30 and the next session the next speaker is also online so i think we should end this session and proceed to the session four so does that mean we are done yes sir we are done and thank you so much for giving your time on saturday
No problem at all. I work 24-7, so I am happy to give time any time that wildlife needs it. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody here, especially uh, you, Dr. Ulas and Dr. Shruti. Thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, I would uh, actively encourage everybody here to please, uh, you know, email us. If you have any questions at all and become a part of Wildlife SOS, you can actively stay connected to us. We are also on Facebook. Uh, and I think my colleague Shirina and Mahima have put all the links possible. So stay connected and uh, be a part of uh, helping us fight wildlife crime and protecting wildlife across mm -hmm. India. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Satyanarayan. It was a very insightful session. Yeah, and we have will have uh, such programs in the future as well. And we will also invite you to share your knowledge so that we can generate more awareness. As you said, we need more people in conservation so that we can tackle this problem uh, by contributing a little bit. Certainly. Thank you and have a good day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, I uh, am I audible? First of all, I would like to ask. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. I welcome you all to once again to the certificate course on environmental science and con conservation studies. I am privileged to introduce our, fourth, uh, our speaker for the fourth session, Dr. Ennis. Uh, she will be addressing the topic green criminology in the context of the use and conservation of wildlife. Uh, Dr. Ines is a biologist in the National Autonomous University of Mexico with a, with a PhD in biodiversity management and a post-doctoral uh, post fellowship. Uh, Dr. Ines worked as a full-time researcher at Mexico's National University on Wildlife Use, con Conservation and Green Criminology, recently leading to international collaboration on the dynamics of wildlife trade between Mexico and European Union. Our academic project with North, uh, an academic project with Northumbria University and a consultancy project for the European Commission. Her work experience has been in the public, social and private sector and her recent project has involved national and foreign organizations. She has publications on the role of Mexico in international wildlife trade and is currently chair of the IUCN Green Criminology Specialist Group. A global network created to provide guidance on identifying transgressions harmful to humans, environments, and wildlife, regardless of legality per se. Presently, she is working on an interdiscipl interdisciplinary project, a historical perspective of the trade and fur and leather for the wild species involving Mexico 18th to 21st century. Uh, I, I, uh, a very warm welcome to Dr. Ennis. Uh, before I hand it over to you, ma'am, uh, I would like to request the audience to post the questions uh, or discussion points at the chat book, and they, the questions will be surely addressed in the question at Q&A round. Uh, at the end of the session, we will provide you with a feedback form that you are required to fill, and the session is going to, uh, going to be for 90, 90 minutes, uh, where last 15 to 20 minutes are for question and, question and answer round. In order to adhere to the timing, we are going to ring two bells, one at 60 minutes and another at 70 minutes. Uh, so now over to you, Dr. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I'm very honored to be here and I'm very honored to share the panel with such distinguished um, speakers from, from other regions. Um, so I shall begin uh, sharing my screen. And thank you also for all the audience that is um, present here. Mm. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, should I start now with the presentation? Okay, so as, um, so as Nancy, um, Mention I work in Mexico, I'm a national Mexican and I work at the National University in Mexico in um, green criminology and wildlife use um, topics among other 
other subjects. So I'll be talking today, as I was invited to talk about green criminology in the context of the use and conservation of wildlife. Um, as a general introduction, um, I'm sure most of you know already what's uh, the subject of uh, the line of research, uh, green criminology. It's um, a, so, a discipline within environmental criminolo criminology, and uh, it's a research area that focuses on environmental harm, crime, victimization, law, social and environmental justice, environmental regulation, but also moral and philosophical issues and how humans, non-humans, plants, ecosystem in general, and its components are related and how we interact with nature in these regards. Um, so green criminology consider harms that are committed by powerful institutions like states, corporations, the military apparatus, as well as by ordinary people, individuals in common, um, um, common and everyday practices. So um, this is a general introduction before starting to talk about um, how could we can take hold of green criminology and its top disciplines as um, theoretical frameworks to talk uh, about the um, use of wildlife in particular. So in the 90s, um, there was a movement of, for criminology to take environmental crimes more seriously or seriously. Um, so Lynch in the 1990s introduced the term green criminology. So emerged a green criminology dedicated to the study of crimes against nature. It began in this decade and has since then generally accelerated through discussions, conference, books, articles, research articles, specialized books, magazines, congresses, and meetings, and so on. And more recently, green criminology has begun to figure in university curricula, unfortunately, and other discipline fields, but still we have so much to do regarding the academic environment on these issues, especially in the global south, as I will be mentioning later. So over the past, I won't be stopping um, to discuss what are the various definitions of green criminology, so I can get um, uh, to discuss deeper the, the issue of um, wildlife use. But um, over the past decade or more, various definitions of green criminology have been developed, and there are different authors work, um, who have worked on this. Um, for instance, just to mention uh, a couple, Lynch and Stratexti in different um, works, they, they define green criminology, an act that may or may not violate existing norms and environmental regulations, has identifiable environmental harm results, and it originates from human actions. They highlight the impact of global corporations and the global socioeconomic context, emphasize that the permanent existence of environmentally destructive behaviors has a lot to do with the nature of capitalism, to increase productivity, obtain profits, economic growth, and consumption, which result in environmental harms, as we all know. For instance, White proposes an eco-global criminology, which is um, based on ecological considerations and critical analysis on a world scale. He uh, proposes an inclusive definition of harm. He differ differentiates between harm and crime, between legal and illegal, and he includes perspectives on victimization and conceptions of justice, socially and environmentally speaking, as we will see um, further in the talk. I mean, I'm um, sorry to go back. This is, these are just uh, pictures of, I don't know if you heard about the Totoaba bladders uh, being um, traded uh, illegally from Mexico to Asia. Um, so these are pictures of some seizures that took place in Mexico. Um, so um, green criminology is, um, so this, is, this slide is very important because um, green criminology is continually evolving theoretically. So this is intellectually an open as a frame of reference that we, we could take hold of and continue um, contributing to this through our research, through our work, through our uh, publications, through our field work to continue developing um, this line of research um, 
in all the subjects that I've mentioned already. So this is something we, we should continue um, studying, but not also studying. Um, we, we need to think that we can contribute as part of a global South um, to, to bring our research and to our experience and, and go ahead and, and write something and publish. So, so um, I will now continue to talk about green criminology in the context of the use and conservation of wildlife and how we can take all of these um, research um, line of work to develop um, and analyze case studies and, 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 and see what's going on in the real world and, and on this subject. So through, the green, through green criminology and the use of wildlife, we can analyze how humans, non-human animals, the ecosystem and its components are related. Emphasizing environmental harms and crimes victimization, taking account of law, social and environmental justice, of course, regulation, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, moral and philosophical issues. Um, so it's important to mention that uh, green criminology differs from conventional criminology by recognizing that harm caused to nature, uh, wildlife, flora and fauna, is a problem that needs rigorous attention, not only when there is a breach in the legislation, this is very important, but also when activities are carried out in such a manner that although guaranteed by law, um, generate injustice and inequity, both social and environmental. So we consider in this line of work, harms against non-human species, the predominance of a vision that sees wildlife as inferior, exploitable and expendable. And we also take a look and consider abuse, mistreatment or death of non-human species, for example, in global trade, even um, considering global trade or um, legal or illegally and all practices that, that consider legal and illegal and that, um, that abuse other, other species. Um, so the um, green criminology in uh, regarding um, the use of wildlife is based, so this is a scientific research based um, both in natural and social sciences. So we're talking about here an interdisciplinary field of work we could be talking about um, people working from law, from international relations, biodiversity management, conservation biology, environmental economics, politics, sociology, cultural studies, anthropology, and so on. So we need to um, work in develop interdisciplinary projects. Um, we cannot work this line of um, research only from one of these angles. And this is really important. So for instance, I will be, um, I will start now uh, giving some examples from my own work and from um, other people's work also, but um, talking um, how, for instance, in this um, example, how can we interact from green criminology with other disciplines to explain some um, study cases? and try to understand better what, what, what has happened in, um, in our world, um, for instance, historically. So I've been working with um, a specialist here in Mexico. Um, she specializes in global history. So from my perspective and her per perspective, I've been, um, we've been developing from the past months um, a project, an interdisciplinary project, of course, about Global history, green criminology, and sea otter case, which uh, is an example that dramatically illustrates that the commercial value of sea otter pelts led to the near extinction of the species. So um, the demand for sea otters, uh, for the people who don't know, uh, by Spanish, Russian, English, and American fur companies for the dense and durable properties of their skins during the 18th and 19th centuries, resulted in a hunting over exploitation and near extinction of these animals. So we use global history um, to, to um, analyze and understand 
how the historical maritime fur trade resulted in a worldwide reduction of sea otter populations to fewer than 2,000 animals in widely dispersed remnant populations. Um, during a century and a half of massive exploitation and search for these animals in very isolated places, the otters disappear from most of their historical range. And in addition, in the 20th century, as, as we all know, other anthropogenic pressures also intervene in the decline of sea otters. So as a result, I mean, put it in a very um, simplified way, as today, sea otters are classified as an endangered species according to their large scale decline, according to the IUCN list. So for instance, in this case, if we take a look at the um, theoretical framework from white um, eco-global crime perspective, we can conclude undoubtedly that the trade involved in sea otters during the 18, 19 and 20 centuries can be typified as a green crime on a global scale. Due to what? To its trans transnational nature, several countries involved in the distribution chain, either as a centers of origin, places of transit or wildlife destinations, the interconnectedness of ecosystems through the distribution patterns of the ot otter, as you can see in this map, the presence of harms caused by the other exploitation of others and therefore deterioration of ecosystems. Also injustice in the value chains due to the concentration of profits in just a few sectors, in addition to the presence of crimes through over exploitation and illegal trafficking as well. The differences and variations at the local and regional level regarding the management of other populations. So, so as you see, I've, I've already um, mention the eco-global crime perspective of, and how we can include this perspective to analyze um, a particular case. So following white, in the case of the global um, over-exploitation and extermination of the sea otters, we identify both social and environmental harms um, and also long-term impacts of these harms. So in fact, the historic demand for otters has resulted in not only the hunting of Enidra lutris, which are the sea otters, but also of other otter species around the world, bringing several species to the brink of extinction in many regions. So in South Asia, for example, specifically in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal, illegal hunting of other otters for their fur is ongoing and represents a serious threat to different populations. The risk of extinction of the four species of Asian otters is currently the highest priority globally. So behind the destructive and devastating practices on other species, there are economic and expansion motivations, which are reflected in the consumption patterns of transnational products and the commodification of nature. But there are also cultural foundations that we have to take into account, our sense of ethics and values when we revise these case studies, not just the economic um, side of the story. And, and in this sense, we need to also take a look at the relationship we forge with nature. So this is why I'm, I'm talking about making uh, interdisciplinary projects. We, we have to talk with anthropologists, with people working in cultural studies, so not to um, point out at the causes from economic um, motivations, but other, other um, deeper um, reasons or causes from um, uh, observing all these uh, type of um, phenomena in our, in our story and in our present. So if we take um, at another perspective from green criminology, which is green victimology, also in this other case, we, we can take hold of green victimology, I'm sorry, as an interdisciplinary meeting space to rethink otherness beyond possession. So uh, green victim victimology proposes and encourages us to question the compulsive inclination to demarcate the territory of what is human from what is not human as one of the great forces that um, have been directing history, a territorial delimitation that not only implies violence, but inspires, and world characterized by a loss of a clear distinction between nature and culture, 
a vision of the meaning of our nature, the meaning of our others, use of others and exclusion of others. So the values of the prevailing economic thought based on a consumer society and interaction with violent, destructive and unequal nature, um, we can take a look at this from the green victimology perspective. Another perspective only um, also um, looking at the other case, it's another subdiscipline from green criminology, which is green cultural criminology. Of recent development, um, this subdiscipline is concerned with understanding the products, processes, tensions, and trends around consumption, the environment, health and happiness. And these allow us to explore the convergence between cultural and criminal processes in our contemporary and also historical, historical um, social life. Cultural criminology is defined by an ethnographic sensitivity that helps to understand cultural practices and opens investigation to the meaningful worlds of others. Mm, and this, I mean people and also um, other um, species. Um, green criminology and cultural criminology in this case come together to build bridges and address the various risk factors through approaches that redefine, that can help us redefine, reconstruct and transform our relationship with nature, with our natural world in a socially and environmental fair way. So we can take all of this um, subdiscipline as well um, to look at uh, different cases. This is just an example. We can analyze uh, many, many cases regarding fauna and flora or ecosystems and, and take hold of all these perspectives that um, actually are continually, continuously developing. So um, to wrap up, um, we can use green criminology to identify problems, develop persuasive evidence and arguments, make interdisciplinary connections, as I just did, um, try not to generalize, analyze case by case scenarios, contexts, geographical patterns, take into account, of course, cultures, different regions, ensure social and environmental rights are present in our, in our analysis and, and works um, with the goal to influence, of course, policy and practice within the political space. So a discipline that is its relatively short host, uh, history has set out to address issues related to the harm of non-human species and ecosystems. For instance, uh, if we look at the ecological justice perspective within green criminology, um, this perspective argues that justice must consider not only human victims of crime, but also crimes committed against the environment, flora and fauna. As I mentioned, recognize the legal systems often reduce wildlife to property. In the 20th century, the issue of victims of environmental harm has developed as an important area of academic debate. Light has been shed on the need to recognize the suffering of a series of victims that were previously invisible or still are to both, to both justice systems and the general public. And this is where we have to work in case uh, we detect some cases where um, there are justice systems where um, victims are not um, still recognized. So it is necessary to pay attention and concerns uh, ourselves with the study, reflection and analysis of the domain from a perspective that sees wild species as inferior, exploitable and disposable. But in this regard, it is not only um, necessary to do this, it's also necessary to understand also why people harm animals and not only in a criminal context and not only in an economic context. So we um, also can take hold of green criminology subdisciplines and, and for instance, look at the, the subject of animal abuse as we can um, 
analyze other subjects, but in, the, in this case, um, we, can, we can revise this. So um, as a general definition, animal abuse, as any act that contributes to the pain, suffering, or death of an animal or that threatens its well-being, can be physical, psychological, or emotional, may involve active abuse or passive neg negligence or omission. And um, I included, I know I'm talking about wildlife, I, inc I included a dog here because um, um, green criminology looks in the subject of animal abuse to also domestic species, not only wildlife. Um, so we need to consider um, all beings, not just um, wildlife in this strict sense of animal abuse. There are many, many, many um, works about animal abuse. This is just an example, but it's a very uh, good one because it, it's a very um, thorough book. Um, which offers a wide range of perspective on the nature of animal abuse. It's a very um, um, complete reference. Um, so I recommend this, this book. But um, so when we talk about animal abuse from the green criminological perspective, we, we look at different actors involved, different behaviors, different motivations that are related to financial considerations, to labor restrictions, to predisposition, exercise of power, etc., and and thus there there are the various typologies um, regarding why people um, involved in these type of practices. So, um, nurse is, a, is is one of the main um, authors ha, has been working on this issue. Um, so. Um, in this book, for instance, about animal harm, perspectives on why people harm and kill animals, um, he takes a look at wildlife crimes and abuse. He works on the distinction between morally unacceptable and legally admissible conduct, criminology, criminological profiles that I will um, talk about um, in the next slides. He includes domestic animals. Um, he talks about different activities involving animal harm, like traditional sports. Um, he, of course, considers culture as a driver, as I mentioned, hunting, wildlife trade, etc. So, for instance, if we, I mean, we can go into this perspective um, from different angles, but um, since we, we don't have all day to talk about this, um, I decided to, for instance, look at the typologies or typologies um, on abuse and crime against animals. Um, so he developed uh, different models um, regarding behaviors and motivations of people to talk about why, why people um, develop this, um, these practices like this. Um, so for instance, um, he mentions uh, the model a, he calls the traditional model, the traditional criminal model. Um, so I will go through in general terms through, through um, one of these models. And afterwards, I will give some examples from my work. Um, so we better understand what he, he is um, meaning. So for instance, um, the criminal model traditional, the motivation is to obtain direct personal financial benefit there is an opportunity to do this, and there is an absence of other way out to obtain um, financial um, gains. So the animals are seen as commodities. This is a rational decision. And um, probably in some cases there are, there's without, um, this, this happens without fully knowledge of the legislation, except in cases of legal trade. Um, what, what's the justification or the justification of people talking about this, um, um, doing, I mean, taking um, these activities in practice, is the species uh, use is seen as a minor crime. So people involved in these activities, they don't see this like a very serious crime. So we're here, for instance, talking about wildlife trade that we all know international wildlife trade, for instance, is a high profit activity and a very low risk activity like um, international activity, um, which is both legal and illegal. 
Animals are plants, not only animals, are considered exploitable commodities. As we all know, this is the pet market, medicine and trade, the food market, luxury items for the fashion industry, clothing, accessories, as we can see in the pictures. These are from the Mexican um, City International Airport. Uh, water snake skins from Asia, tarantulas for the pet, I mean, for the leather industry, um, the tarantulas for the pet trade, also turtles for the pet trade, and so on. So this is an example of criminal model um, traditional wild species as commodities. So despite the legality and regulation of much, of much of the wildlife trade in, in terms of international conventions like um, and treaties like CITES or national legislation uh, by country, still the way animals are trafficked and the conditions in which they are transported and treated are often characterized by abuse. So this was an abandoned cargo in Mexico City International Airport of um, tarantulas coming from Chile. So the people abandoned the, the cargo and, and after some days, um, um, I was working that doing some field work with the people from the environmental authorities, and we discovered that the the cargo was filled um, full with uh, tarantulas in a very very small um, basis, like for um, ice cream. Um, so all the tarantulas were already out of the of these compartments, and so it was very very. Um, characterized by abuse, uh, this cargo, for instance, now. So going back to our models from NERS, um, we have the criminal, the criminal model economic with the motivation is the competition with predators, um, also social pressures from people, um, from employers, fear of losing employment. In this, in this model, there are no financial gains, the rationale being illegal activities, um, um, holding employers accountable who subject them to such pressure to support families, for instance, no? So like we're talking about um, people helping um, hunters in as guides or as an example. So these are also considered minor crimes. Um, um, in this case, we're talking about, um, as I said, sport hunting, fishing, and so on. So. The next model, um, which is masculinity, um, it, this is the motivation. The main motivation is the exercise of power and strength, the affirmation of masculinity, pleasure and excitement. This is mainly a male environment. There's union between older and young men. There are secret societies, and this happens all around the world. I mean, um, we have cockfighting, dogfighting, um, illegal and um, legally. Uh, in Mexico, there are other um, cultural practices like this in other countries. So this is an activity. These are activities rarely carried out by individuals acting alone. The justification is a deep-rooted cultural practices, and um, there are sports, entertainment, organized crime, and gambling involved. The hobby model. Um, the motivation is an obsessive compulsive nature, collection and acquisition of products to catalog, classify. There is no direct financial gain and no part of a business or occupation. The criminal nature of the activity is denied. There's also low risk. And we're talking about um, illegal commodities like rare books, stolen paintings, egg collectors, um, invertebrate collections, um, taxidermy collectors, and so on. Um, finally, the stress criminal model, we have as a motivation, the stress relief. There's no direct financial gain. There are symptoms of psychological disturbance, possible interpersonal violence, unhealthy environments involves cruelty and torture. Um, in general, the criminal nature of the activity is denied. We're talking about children or women who abuse, abuse animals to externalize their own abuse, abusers forcing a child to abuse an animal, and so on. So, so for instance, if we take into account the um, crime models A to E proposed by NERS, we can 
we, we then we look at reality and in our context and in our regions, in our um, countries, micro regions, towns, communities. And we, we, we see that we can uh, find different, um, we find variants of models. I mean, it's not a strict um, way of um, how life works in this sense. I mean, you can see that a model A can mix a bit with a model B or B with C or C with D, or even as we work our research, we can find other models that are not considered, considered by nurse. So this is um, what I meant when I said that these are theoretical frameworks that are continually evolving. So we should uh, consider this um, as a base to start working and to analyze case studies, but then um, think as well. We need to always think and analyze um, about our own contexts, about um, our own cultures, um, take into account um, our traditions, our the species involved, whether they are wild, domestic, whether this is a legal or illegal activity and so on, and, and try to understand um, different scenarios that haven't been analyzed yet. So in this regard, for instance, um, if we use at, as the if we use the traditional model and the masculinity model from nurse, no, we analyze, for instance, this in my case, this is a Mexican import of mm, 5,000 cobra um, snakes, um, cobra skins, sorry. Um, so we see in this um, example that we, we have the model A traditional, but also the model C masculinity. And we have wildlife involved. We have non-native species. Of course, we don't have cobras in Mexico. So we, we see that, uh, of course, this is a traditional model because uh, there's a financial gain, there's a, an economic motivation, but also why Mexico imports these skins, I mean, uh, we have a, a leather industry well developed in Mexico, um, but there's a national market looking for these skins with the head included as, as we want to make these boots, no? Um, for, um, so the men feel um, more powerful, more macho. Um, so, so this is all, it's a cultural route with traditional, um, the model, yeah, both are involved in this case. Um, for instance, um, and this is the case um, for the, I mean, this is a cobra case, but we also in Mexico have um, imports of um, pythons that have been used um, also for the fashion industry. So Mexico imports a lot of um, thousands of thousands of python skins e every year to make leather products and then to consume by the national market, but also to uh, Mexico as a re-exporter to the European Union or to the United States. So this is a real cases uh, looked at using the models by nurse. Another case, um, not just the leather industry, but the live animal legal market in Mexico which has traditional model, but also the cultural model. We, these are native species um, uh, with the aim of being distributed in the, in the live animal market. Um, this is a um, reptile fair in Mexico City where you can see the snakes. And on the other pictures are um, another abandoned cargo international airport, um, which was um, left near the sun so all the animals nobody knew that there were live animals within the boxes so all the animals died so um this is both these are both uh, legal examples um but as you can see in one of them um there is harm there is killing and there's abuse um i mean if we if we talk about the victimology perspective as well so for instance, another model using cultural and traditional also for the live animal legal market 
So these are imports in Mexico from this bird. Um, you can see some of the cages arrive, uh, the birds arrive safe. And on the other pictures, you can see all of them are dead because they were um, transported uh, in not a very um, 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 good way, I mean. Um, so this is also legal, but there's abuse, there's um, present. Um, regarding non-native species, this is also the traditional model and the cultural model, but with native species, this is a tradition in Mexico, um, people uh, selling and caring a lot about these birds um, because they are taking them to the churches to be baptized, not baptized, but um, to be recognized by the religion in a sacred way. Um, and so this is another very rooted cultural activity in Mexico. And we can see both um, models as well represented here. So in another example, um, this is the model masculinity and the model cultural using wildlife um, and domestic species. So in, um, in towns in the peninsula of Yucatan in Mexico, you can see this traditional ritual, which people and mainly men, um, young men within the, the, um, the festivities of their town, they put inside the piñatas, they, they put live animals previously captured by the local children, like iguanas and opossums, and they hit the piñatas until the animals are dead. Um, and afterwards, I mean, if they, if they don't manage to kill the animals, you can see below a young man, a young man um, trying to kill the opossum um, directly. Uh, out of the piñata. So this is uh, other examples of um, criminal activities um, causing harm and suffering in animals in Mexico. Another one, um, another activity within the same uh, festivity is uh, when the piñata celebration ends, the opossums have died, the dogs make their appearance. So this bird is tied by the legs to a structure made of wood and those who are considered contestants have to jump to take the dog by the head and tear off the head. So whoever succeeds will take the body of the dog home. So we are talking here about masculinity, cultural practices, wildlife species are also domestic species. So we were talking about here traditions, heritage and identity, people assemble to watch entire families clap and laugh. This is a moment that gives community identity and what is the, uh, the justification of the, these people? This is historical background. Young people don't know what they do this. And they talk about, well, my grandparents used to do this, so I do it. So they don't question the activity whatsoever. The permanence of the past, we can see alive in the presence still. And I'm sure uh, we can analyze these type of traditions um, all over the world. Um, and but the thing is, here, um, try to understand why people do this and see how, how we can um, talk about this, not just um, take the criminological perspective as a, in terms of uh, police, like, like don't, you can't do this. You don't have to harm these animals. Um, why, why, like from a, an outsider's perspective, so we cannot do this. Um, we have to try to consider all the angles and try to understand the historical reasons why people do this, not to justify the activity, but to go deeper. So for instance, in this case, I think um, if an interdisciplinary project is developed, there, there should be anthropologists, people working from cultural studies, sociologists, um, um, obviously, I mean, biologists or people looking at animal abuse, um, but about different angles, I need to, to develop a dialogue, a socio-environmental dialogue to try to understand these practices. Um, because this is just one example. I'm sure there are other examples just within Mexico and I'm sure on, in other countries in your area, um, there should be other rituals that should be looked at. Um, 
and try to see how can we um, reconsider after so many years of practice, what should be done in, in terms of, of the whole society, um, not just one side of the society. I mean, the people involved in the activity, but um, we care. So we need to all um, establish a dialogue about these issues. So um, as we can see in the examples, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going quite uh, fast because of the time. So um, we can see harm to animals is complex and has different motivations. So it's not just a straightforward um, thing to look at. Um, we need to understand the psychology of users. In some cases, the economic pressures, I mean, in this last example, um, no, but um, uh, in others, yes, we need to look at the economic pressures of people forced to do something. Um, we need to look at the sociological and cultural issues to help understand the different behaviors and conditions that lead to animal abuse and crime. Why uh, there's a social consent to aggression directed at animals that contributes to establishing a global culture of aggression and not only look at animals as victims, but the entire society is a victim. I mean, it, children looking at these um, violent scenarios, um, do we want this? I mean, uh, we need to think about all, all the victims in, involved, uh, both socially and environmentally. I mean, animals involved, but the old children involved to grow up in a violent environment and things like this. And let's look um, like, for instance, the cockfighting in Mexico, we have children, while the cockfighting takes place, we look at children playing with the, uh, the cocks that are already dead from previous uh, competitions. So children playing with these animals while other animal is being killed. So we need to look at um, all these from different um, angles, as I already said. So. In general, I think that international level, there is a strong, solid and active community doing research on biological and ecological aspects. However, we still lack a critical mass with experience in topics such as green criminology. So we need to develop this um, line of research deeply and wider. So people who do work professionally in criminology don't always keep the issue of wildlife use in mind. So, uh, we need people on, on these subjects, please. So why this uh, line of work and research is relevant? So um, there are many, many, many reasons, but in general, uh, the main ones, I mean, the relevance is um, that we can, if we work from this area, we can identify those factors that incentive harms and illegal practices, but also we need to uh, look at factors and incentives that um, look at positive activities or practices and also record them. And because th this is the most difficult part um, to look at successful stories, but also look at the um, harms and illegal practices. Um, why is relevant? We, need, we, we can contribute to understand how to reconcile the well-being of wildlife with social development. So, a green criminology, although it has the green word on it, um, it's very, very important for you to understand that green criminology looks at both at social and, and environmental um, problems. I mean, they go together, so we cannot separate them. Um, and green criminology concerns about both, not just the well being of animals, but the well being of people as well. Um, understand that harm and abuse are not only related to illegal practices. So what, what's the impact of having a reptile fair in Mexico City, one of the biggest cities in the world? Animal, live animals that people can um, see in cages in, and this is a legal reptile fair. I mean, what are we teaching our children? I mean, in this, in the picture below, I, I took this picture because um, the father was forcing the kid, which is a very, very, very small kid, um, forcing him to touch the snake. So I think it is a, this is a form of abuse as well. 
not just abuse against animals, but um, abuse against the kid who didn't feel comfortable touching the animal. And still the dad was really um, forcing him to do it. So that shocked me. And, and, and I think we have to look um, what are the implications of all this harm and abuse practices in, in all contexts and in, involving all the actors, not just um, the, um, the criminals or, or the animals in one way and, and the other, but just all the actors involved in these um, practices. Um, so green criminology comes at a time when academic researchers are increasingly being we, <laughs> academics, but I think all society um, were increasingly being challenged to demonstrate the practical application of our work and the positive impact on real world problems. So not just, you know, being in the office, reading books and not connecting no? so, uh, with what's going on outside. So this is one of the main contributions from Green Criminology that we, uh, we are trying, we're doing our best to connect with, with the reality and not just uh, worrying about publishing or, or being um, whatever. I mean, in, uh, we should care about what's going on outside. We should care about people. We should care about um, flora and fauna and, and, and ecosystems. Um, so we should continue developing this, re this um, type of research that can contribute in this way as a scientific community, we do, um, we should on um, wildlife and forest crime and how, I mean, we've been trying to have, um, even in, during the pandemic, uh, virtual dialogues within the academia, but also we should reach out and um, develop dialogues with other sectors. So as academics, we can we can do uh, yes, we can publish, but we can we we should uh, mainly be talking about not only with our colleagues but with other with people from other sectors as well. Um, why? I mean, this is uh, um, as the main authors of green criminology um, explain. This is a rendezvous discipline. This is uh, an encounter discipline, as I mentioned already, uh, not only need to look at um, other disciplines, as I mentioned earlier with the author case about you know, global historians or cultural histor um, historians, but also con consider the contributions from other sectors. So this is a discipline um, that needs intersectoral approach. And this is just one example that something that can be done um, like the uh, incredible work from the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Um, the panel identified 16 main topics for which it sought a synthesis of knowledge and opportunities for action. So they convened 16 teams of global experts, not only from academia. So this is why I, I, I like this example. So more than 200 authors from nearly 50 countries work on this effort um, to uh, review and analyze the latest knowledge and provide new thinking and perspectives on how technology policy governance and finance can be applied to obtain, to catalyze, to um, try to reach a more sustainable and prosperous relationship with the ocean. Um, and um, so this is one report from the World um, Resources Institute. Um, so we need to do efforts like this um, to do action, to, to take action, but to do, take action in something um, that considers all the perspectives and all the sectors and considering the local um, problems and consider also the, the local information available and the expertise from the people uh, who is suffering destruction of, of animals um, in situ, for instance, no? For, because um, I don't talk about wild resources anymore. I don't really like to talk about resources because it's an anthropogenic perspective, like if, um, depends on our 
uh, what we need, no, in terms of what we need and and what our needs are. But um, these are animals, or or I mean, marine invertebrates, or or um, whatever um, um, beings we're talking about. But um, so, for instance, in this blue paper, there are um, of, obviously this is just one example. This um, the organized crime in the fishery sectors, but there are other uh, blue papers available that you can. And these are also uh, free, free resources available on, on the internet. Um, so, besides um, this, I mean, as as scientific community, uh, scientific community uh, combating wildlife and forest crime, we can. Um, connect, have dialogues with other sectors. I mean, within the, acad the academic sector, but with other sectors as well. Um, we can uh, make these special reports um, worldwide. And we also have to consider, um, very importantly, um, try to connect with the communities um, who can uh, be the key to, um, to prevent in, in this, um, uh, where we are talking about wildlife, combating wildlife, forest and fisheries crimes. So uh, we've been trying as academics, uh, trying to connect with, with um, um, this issue. And so we recommend this as one of the primary pillars of the, of the, um, um, through the IUCN, for instance, in this event, we, we made specific recommendations to the IUCN on this, on this issue. And, and people around the world have been um, trying to uh, involve in their projects, in their research projects, not just a vertical um, way of look at things, but uh, trying to um, do more horizontal dialogues with the people um, suffering locally, um, the destruction of ecosystems, destruction of animals and plants and so on. So we, we as academia, we should stop working, um, thinking vertically. And this, is, this, this will not go anywhere. This, this will not be a solution. Um, if, we, if we don't interact horizontally with the other sectors, like um, in this case, the communities involved in 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 these um, practices. So, why? I mean, the ultimately goal must be to influence policy and practice within the political space. Uh, for instance, the report that I just mentioned about the organized crime in the fishery sector um, and other blue, the other blue papers, they. Um, um, in they were they were also you know developing summary of these reports for decision makers. So it was not just um, an intellectual um, exercise, but also um, just specific um, recommendation and strategies were aimed at reaching the decision make makers, which is what I'm talking about connecting and reaching other sectors. So from green criminology, um, the contour of social, economic and cultural life locally and globally are being reshaped and new questions every, every day come and fields of research are constantly opening. So we need to leave our eyes open in this regard, not take what has been written about green criminology and wildlife like, um, I mean, take that um, as a base, as a, uh, an amazing and very valuable base to start our work. But think about what is missing out there, what we still have to develop from our um, Southern perspective, um, from developing countries um, to look at things that we can only look at um, um, regarding our particular social, economic, and cultural contexts, and continue developing research in this manner, taking um, hold of green criminology and all the subdisciplines already developed, as I mentioned in the different examples, but trying to develop our own um, proposal to, 
to achieve um, progress in these regards. Um, how to develop concepts for new horizons and socio environmental dialogues. We need to adapt strategies to each situation, to um, particular circumstances and contexts. So we, as I mentioned already, and this is a, like a wrap up, I'm almost finished. Um, we need to build intersectoral alliances, connect with others. I mean, uh, others, I mean, all, all beings, all um, connect with animals, connect with plants, connect with um, ecosystems, connect with other people. Um, we do have to redefine, reconstruct and transform our, our relationship with the natural world. So in this sense, we need to also um, interact, talk, have dialogues with philosophers, with um, people from other disciplines that are not related with management of wildlife and with conservation, protection, more traditional perspectives of, you know, protecting um, wildlife in, in this like um, occidental way of look at things, but more how can, you know, um, transform our relationship with the natural world in less, uh, in a less technical way, more, um, also take into account um, the emotions. And that's why I mentioned earlier um, to be happy. Um, I mean, we have to define what means, um, what happy means, but um, being happy. Um, but this also in the cultural green criminology takes a look at this. So we need to, in this way, reconnect with nature, nature um, and connect with action. This is, um, as I mentioned earlier, we need to, know that we can do a lot of things and not just wait, wait for other countries in the North to do the things or to wait for the Northern, the global North to tell us what to do next because they concentrate more, um, most of the, the financial resources, but we, we have a say and we should redefine our priorities, taking into account our culture, um, our particular context. Um, as modern societies, we're facing global environmental problems, both as causes and consequences of the large scale over exploitation, commodification, and destruction of the natural environment. This is how the world works today, as we've seen in the pandemic. We subordinate and profit from nature as an object of domination, which infallibly leads to degradation and socio environmental and ethical crisis on a global scale, and exclusive and elitist patrimonialization projects. As in the case of the stubborn maritime companies of the global north that I revisited early in the talk, that relentlessly overexploited others for more than two centuries until their extermination. So what, in the words of the sociologist, philosopher, and essayist Bauman, is known as immoral capitalism, as we can see in the picture. We all know about the shark fins. So finally, how to develop concepts for new horizons, the so environmental dialogues. I urge you or invite you, as I did already said, that we need to establish most of knowledge and production of the knowledge that ensure rights and lives from a global South perspective. So in this regard, there are different um, books uh, that have been developed and uh, partic particularly um, perspective developed by David Rodriguez Goyes from Colombia, from the global South in Latin America about developing a Southern green criminology. Um, why? To prevent, again, the universalization of colonialism and Western academic theories. We need to, um, develop our own um, way of thinking, taking into account our own reality in terms of 
biodiversity, richness, endemisms, uh, cultural realities, contexts, um, 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 and so on. No, so this is uh, one of my proposals, and I um, I hope that you um, are motivated and looking forward to to work on particular cases in the regions of research and relationship with wildlife in a way that um, it's um, um, balanced and fair um, and it doesn't have an impact or a negative impact worldwide, no? Because we need to think also that what we do in some place even if it's sustainable locally, and if, if, it, if it has a negative impact, impact somewhere else in another region of another country, it won't, it won't help. I mean, we need to, yes, look at the sustainable way or the fair way or the well-being of animals, plants, and people in, in a particular context, but we also should not, um, uh, stop looking at what we are planning to do in, in a particular place, which impact will have in other um, region in, in the world. As we've seen in the pandemic, it's impossible to continue looking at um, so selfish way of looking at things because all the decisions have an impact in other places. So with this, I end my presentation. I, I thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me. I'm very, very, very thankful. And I'm, I'm here in Mexico. If, if we can construct, um, I mean, the realities in one region and other regions are so different, but we can, um, I invite anybody who would like to know um, to, make a project or share what you have and I can share what I have and, and continue developing this line of, of thinking and doing and, and I'm here. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this very interesting and insightful presentation. And I hope our students learn a lot, lot from this. Uh, so uh, let's quickly move uh, to the Q&A round. Uh, actually, there are so many questions that uh, a lot of students have asked. So I'll, uh, the first question is that when we talk, uh, it's from uh, Ronak, uh, Mr. Ronak, and he wants to know that when we talk about gender and masculinity, what is the correlation between women and other genders to harm and abuse? I don't hear very well. Um, I mean, the audio that uh, is not very clear. Uh, should I repeat? Uh, is it audible now, ma'am? Are you able bit, to Yeah, maybe, um, yeah, maybe it's a, a, a bit better. Yes, thank you. One second. Maybe now it will be fine. Yeah, yes, okay. that's better. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the, first, uh, uh, so the first question is, uh, do gender and masculinity uh, has any correlation between uh, like uh, the crimes done or the harm done on uh, these wildlife people H have any correlation? Yeah. Yes, they do have correlation. I mean, I mentioned the profile from ours about masculinity, um, but uh, the question is a very good one because the role of women in criminal activities regarding wildlife is, is a line of research that it's been developed um, as we speak. So it's very new and we need help. We need um, study cases to have empirical um, information and real uh, world uh, information about the cases um, for instance, we've been looking at the role of uh, women in illegal wildlife trade. And, and there are many, many, many roles that women have. For instance, um, maybe not directly in the activity, like transporting animals or plants, uh, but supporting the husband to do that or, 
I mean, behind the curtains, as we as we say, no. So the, yes, women are are involved um, in the value chains of illegal distribution, but maybe not in the direct way, but as a secondary um, role. So that means that we do have to take a look at and analyze what's the participation of women in the whole. Um, chain of wildlife use in general, not just illegal wildlife trafficking. So for instance, this is just what is the women doing in illegal wildlife trade to help move animals and plants around to transport, to distribute, to sell, to connect with, make a connection between sellers and um, buyers but also, for instance, um, in a research paper that um, I just finished with some colleagues in Mexico, um, we also look at what has been the predominant male environment in the institutions in the government that have been mainly men as inspectors looking at illegal trade and how women are not, um, so involved because they are maybe afraid or, or doing raids or um, special operations. So these are a mainly main environment. And this also um, influence the way that the subject is approached. So it's not just how women are involved in the activities of, of illegal or crimes or harms, but just how are women participating, for instance, in the, in the authority side or in the sector that are drafting the legislation as well. Okay. So it's very complex and we are starting to learn about this as we speak and we need people and help in these subjects. Okay, uh, till then uh, we, can, we have another question from Mr. Indranath and Dr. Anil. Uh, they want to know that how can we stop and raise awareness against such traditional uh, practices uh, that uh, you know induce more violence. How can we stop the traditional? I didn't understand the last part. Uh, the traditional practices against uh, wildlife that happens in countries like you know you said in your presentation as well in Mexico like how. It happens, and then uh, he, uh, Mr. Indranath, have also like talked about like India. Also, it happens that in many uh, festivals, uh, animals are brutally, you know, um, uh, use up, like the violence has uh, done against the animals. So, how can we stop and you know spread awareness towards all these traditional practices? So, I it's I think that subject is very very complex and very complicated because. Um, the green criminology perspective doesn't look, it's not as a um, persecutory approach of work, of, of researching. It's not a police approach. It's, it's a way of trying to um, combine different disciplines and try to understand what's going on and why people do things the way they do things. So we cannot, from the outside, to go and into a community and say, why are you using animals within the piñatas? Or why are you hitting these animals or harming or hurting these um, animals? So we need to, uh, once we understand the phenomenon, um, we need to try to uh, uh, maybe build a, a dialogue with the community but with the help of anthropologists and sociologists um, and, and talk to people and, and make them understand that maybe these, um, these um, activities involve suffering, involve violence, and, and see if these practices may, that maybe 100 years ago had sense in, in a cultural, regarding a specific context, historically speaking, and that maybe the world has been changing and now it doesn't make that sense because we've seen what violence is, implies or what destruction of, of ecosystems imply, in, globally speaking. Yes, we do have to go and, and propose a, 
horizontal dialogue with the people involved in these practices. But not, not in a vertical way and not like, you know, academics here and the community here. No, 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 no. And, and we need to, you know, it's very important to do that with using an interdisciplinary group of people. See, not, and not in a persecutory way of doing things. Okay, so, okay ma'am, that might be like, that might help to answer the question. Uh, that, so another question is by uh, Jason Phillips. Uh, he wants to know, uh, through Mex though Mexico is a big friend of a country named the USA, which is a big wildlife conservation um, investing federation, why isn't the Mexico taking action against this painful atrocities to these innocent birds and animals, which, uh, which are on the race of getting endangered? Um, which did you mend a specific case that I took uh, that I talked about? Yeah, so or, uh, Jason wants to know about the innocent uh, the atrocities against innocent birds and animals. And uh, okay, yeah. So ma, uh, I I showed some pictures about um, some of the importations by Mexico in an international airport, I mentioned some of the tra traditional rituals. So regarding wildlife, um, there are obviously Mexico is a CITES party and which is uh, very amazing is that some of the pictures that I show, this is a um, legal trade. So this is why I, I was talking at the beginning why from green criminology perspective, harm is very important. Re regardless of whether it's legal or illegal. So in green criminology, yes, we need to look at uh, if it's legal, even though a cargo has a permit, both from international CITES or national authorities, it doesn't mean that the animals are well treated. So we as green criminologists or environmental scientists of um, conservation biologists or whatever field we're working from, um, we need to look at harm um, separated from the legalistic approach. So regarding wildlife and regarding domestic species is very, very difficult because um, well, wildlife and domestic species, let's talk about it locally. For instance, the pictures that I show in the traditional ritual do have these opossums or iguanas that, that are not endangered species. That doesn't make the people the right to violent these animals, to kill them, to um, mistreat them or uh, make them suffer, even though they are not endangered species. They are protected by law. We have uh, in Mexico, um, I don't know, in India, or it, it's um, by region, how, how it's the legislation there. I guess it's politically by states, or I don't know. But here, every state has a specific legislation theoretically protecting these animals as they are wildlife. I mean, uh, the dogs, nobody cares about the dogs, obviously. Nobody cares about these um, domestic animals, but we do have legislation protecting the, um, these animals. And because they are not in danger or, or the people, they don't value them, they, they feel that they can do whatever they want with them. Um, I don't know if, if, if that's that's a cultural aspect of the relationship these people have with these animals. That's um, that's related with masculine power. With I I I am superior with uh, uh, I am um, superior with the uh, in comparison with the animals, so I can do whatever I want with them. So that's cultural. That's masculine. I mean, in that uh, specifically event there are not women involved directly in the event, but I don't know who's making the, the piñatas, for instance, no? So let's, that's related to the other question about the gender, the role of, of the different genders. So, um, so that, that, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> and I, I lost um, the, the, 
moderator. I mean, I don't see her screen. I don't know if I she's she lost the communication. I don't know if somebody has another question. I can take the question while she comes back. I think she lost the communication. We are getting her back. She's back now. Um, I see in the chat, it's a direct message. Um, I see a question about if the sea cucumber smuggling is happening in Mexico. Um, yes, it's happening in Mexico. We have sea cucumber species um, from um, in the peninsula Yucatan, which is the, um, the side of the Caribbean Sea and also from the Pacific. Um, um, the, yes, the government is trying to control and if these um, animals are, are living for Asian markets illegally. And yes, the government has been um, trying to, to take action into this, obviously. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. No, I will take a question. I guess, uh, Marcy, can you? Yeah. I'm so sorry, my yeah, network please continue. What happened. Yes, so another no. question uh, is from uh, Dr. Naresh. He wants to know how green criminologists do to prevent crimes where the environment crime is more effective and suggest your opinions on how it should be improved. Like how uh, crime against environment should be improved by green criminologists. I don't, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, could you rephrase? rephrase? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Naresh wants to know that how green criminologists can do to improve, like to, uh, you know, to improve or be more effective against the crime done against the environment. Well, there are, there are different um, uh, uh, ways to, to do that. I mean, it depends which sector is, is working from green criminology. I mean, we, green criminology can be used by policymakers, can be used as a theoretical framework um, to support the draft of legislation, for instance. Um, so this area of research can be used as a reference as a theoretical reference or as a practical reference as well, because there are a lot of research case from case studies that can be used by policymakers to support what they want to do, to implement an action, a strategy, or a legislation package. So, so we as academics, we should, um, that's what I was trying to say at the end, try to intersect with others, um, with other groups that are trying to stop or deter this um, criminological and harmful activities and give the tools, the references, the information, so they can proceed. No, so that's a, that's a way to help, to uh, have an impact in the, in the um, political actions, the policy, the strategies, and the legislation. So if we as researchers or academics work and just, you know, make a publication and put it in our bookshelf and make a book and then celebrate and that's it. And, you know, don't, don't send this information uh, as a feedback to people who's, you know, in, in, in facing these activities as, as somebody was asking about the sea cucumber. What's the point? There's no point. So whether you're working in an NGO, in academia, or in the government, or in a local community, you can use green criminology to support your decisions and your actions. And, and that's, that, that, that's really what the main uh, purpose of green criminology is. Uh, thank you so much for the answer, ma'am. And there's one more question, uh, which is, how do you see the palm oil sector taking over great forest in uh, South Southeast Asia and consequences on a uh, wi uh, wildlife population through it? 
could just uh, uh, it's because the communication i'm sorry to ask you to repeat okay, because sometimes okay. your, your voice uh it, it cuts a bit for me but um okay don't worry i'll repeat the question again so how do you see the palm oil sector taking over uh -huh. great forest in southeast asia and what are its consequences on wildlife population well any any activity destroying any forest any ecosystem has a global connection i mean any i mean locally you will be destroying a food chain completely i mean if you um, take away the habitat for a key species as a you know a primate or a um, um, jaguar or a, a, then you affect all the, um, the the food ecosystem and the the food chain in the in the specific habitat but also if you degrade an habitat in a region then you affect the whole climate, the whole uh, climate of the world, and then you will be affecting another uh, region. So everything is connected. I mean, this is very, very important from green criminology that we need not to look at, um, it doesn't matter what happens in Borneo, it doesn't matter for me if I live in Mexico, what happens in, in, in Amazonas. Yes, it, it does. I mean, I do have to care, I mean, I'm talking about Mexican examples today because I, I've been working here, but I, I should be caring about, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, Mexico, as I said, is importing a lot of um, skins from pythons from Indonesia. So what's going on in Indonesia about destruction of these snakes? I mean, as far as we know, we know that it's not, this is not a sustainable offtake these species are being, uh, uh, being um, extracted from the wild. These are not captive bred animals. So I should be caring about what's happening in Indonesia when these snakes and how the extraction of these high level species from the ecosystem is it will affect the whole chain and the whole habitat in the region because this will affect the whole planet, not just Indonesia or not just one region of Indonesia. So what happens in the palm oil, of course, is affecting everything. I mean, specifically, it will affect uh, uh, orangutans. And then if you take the orangutans out, all the species, all the disequilibrium or, uh, will continue. But um, I think um, going back to the um, theoretical framework from white in eco-global criminology, that's an example, the question about the palm oil, it's an eco-global criminology perspective that we need to look at cases using this perspective because what happens in one place, it will affect other places. So, I should not ignore the fact that we at Mexico is demanding thousands of skins of Indonesian or, or from Vietnam or from mainly from Indonesia, but from other countries in the area that they're sending us, the, the leather industry is demanding these skins. And we, yes, we have our CITES import permit and in the theory, Indonesia is making the non-detriment findings following CITES to make sure that the importers of their skins are being extracted sustainably without making a detriment in the, in the place to the species, to the population. Is this happening? I mean, Mexico is sure that this is happening still we are importing these skins. And this the same happens for the palm oil. People are, dem are demanding the palm oil to have many, many, many products, edible products to be happy. What's happening if we are demanding this palm oil? We should care. 
Uh, okay, ma'am. So I think uh, it's. I'm going to take one last question for this session. Uh, the question is: uh, a lot of uh, students have asked, like, if a student takes environmental uh, crime as a career, what are the career options ahead in future in national and international uh, perspective? So, um, as far as I know, and as far as I'm concerned, people working in green criminology have a, a background in other disciplines, as I mentioned earlier. So you have people that were first biologists and then specialized in conservation biology or environmental studies, and then in criminology. Obviously, this is an interdisciplinary, I mean, conservation biology look at policy, economics, um, law, and philosophy, ethics, etc. So you can either arrive from environmental sciences and then criminology, or I do work with colleagues from Mexico and from other countries that, um, that were first um, come traditional criminologists and then specialize in environmental studies. And then they meet in, in, in green criminology but you can arrive from different disciplines. As far as I know, um, this field of study is a specialization. It's not that something you, you can study maybe after high school, not yet, directly. You, you need to you know, choose from where are you going to arrive in this discipline. So you can either arrive from history or cultural studies or but mainly, mainly, mainly all the people working in green criminology arrive either from environmental studies or, or, um, or criminology. As this is what has happened, but I'm sure and I hope that this will change because we need to have more um, um, green criminologists teaching and, and helping doing projects. So we need more people um, studying this, um, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank especially, you so much. Especially from the, especially, I'm sorry to interrupt, especially from it's the okay. global south. So, especially we need green criminologists with the global south perspective. Please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being so patiently patiently answering all the questions thank you so much for your time ma'am it was an honor to be with you so we cannot due to time constraint we cannot answer a few more other questions that are still there but we'll definitely address them through uh, email uh, so i would like to uh, hand over to mr uh, dr ullas so uh, thank you so much ma'am my thank honor you, <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Ness, to agreeing and to uh, delivering an insightful lecture on green criminology. Uh, there were many examples how can a person from criminology and other fields can uh, do research, interdisciplinary research to contribute towards conservation. I'm sure that many of people who are there, are participants, are inspired to pursue research, their career in conservation. That was the whole idea behind organizing this particular uh, program. Uh, to be honest, I was a little concerned before I uh, started gathering ideas and started building up this particular program because this is a very niche area, right? And uh, unfortunately, we have very uh, few people working in this area. So I, I was not sure how will people respond but the way we people have responded to this particular event and uh, throughout the couple of days we have been there and looking at different uh, the comments from people, uh, they are getting inspired for different ideas for research and for career and everything. Uh, I hope that we have fulfilled the expectations from the participant side. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, those people who were involved in uh, giving lectures, they were very insightful and experienced enough to uh, share their knowledge with their uh, whatever they are practicing right now with different examples and everything. So it has been great, uh, th this particular event. And uh, uh, we hope that we will also organize such events in the future so that, this, so that we can take it this particular uh, movement, which I think we have just started from our point of view, uh, to forward and to have more people contributing and working in this particular area to address this 
eminent uh, problem which we all are facing at this moment. And I understand it is very early for you, Dr. Ennis. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. The honor was mine and I'm very, very thankful for the invitation and I hope it was um, useful in some way and I'm looking forward to, to work with you if possible in the future. Definitely, so definitely. Nice. Yeah, this is also a, a common area which we are looking. We also have a center where we have people around. So there are many criminologists in our department, psychologists are working for this particular cause. We also have a dedicated school School of Environmental and Sustainability uh, who are working in this area. So we have a lot of people who have interest in uh, conservation and will definitely have a, a collaboration in future. We'll see how it goes uh, to work on certain research areas because I feel that situation in Mexico and India, it's a little similar, the, the practices and everything. So this is where we can apply culturally whatever you are applying over there to uh, promote wildlife conservation over here. Because as you said that this is a very complex issue where when we look it into uh, traditional practices and everything. So we have to deal it very carefully. Your experience will really count over here when we apply these uh, you know, tricks or these, uh, these techniques over here in order to conserve environment in India. Yeah, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate about this initiative and all the amazing um, speakers that you um, you brought together. So I hope this uh, we we can um, I can you know join your initiative and continue doing activities like this um, every year, not just this year, but every year. Yeah, we definitely, should, uh, I like hope the pandemic, I'm sorry to interrupt. I hope the pandemic ends soon and we can post you over here physically or a conference maybe. And uh, so that people can get together and share their ideas on physical rather than having a difficult conversation over internet. That is something which I hope we can do it in future. We, we should uh, plan um, some, uh, not a sh maybe a, a bit larger course uh, between the universities, Mexico and, and your university, like for every year, for every generation of students that come and also inviting students who are in the field doing research to come and, and share with us their experiences because this is what we need. We need people from the field and we need to, um, not just interact once, but um, make a, a, a working group, constant working group from the global south in green criminological um, aspects. And yes, so I, I think we can definitely work on that trend where continuous uh, uh, interactions are important in order to take this forward, not just yearly as in once or twice, but to have a group working together, sharing ideas, sharing their expertise, since it is an international field, it requires expertise from different backgrounds, right? From criminology, from conservation, I'm from forensics. So it is required to collaborate all together and to share ideas to bring out the best, I think. I agree entirely and count me, count me. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone for joining us. Uh, I there is whole team which was working with me uh, in order to organize this particular uh, uh, event. Uh, Professor Vipin, Professor Palmi, uh, Mansi, Shruti, and Mahima. We are all team working together in in order to organize this. Uh, they were there in managing the whole event, uh, and hopefully we will bring such events in the future to you. Uh, keep visiting uh, Jib's events page for future events. And uh, I hope we will see you soon again. Take care and uh, good night. Thank you. Bye, please thank fill you. The, yeah, uh, please fill the uh, feedback form, uh, those who are there. And once you fill it, uh, I request you to uh, leave the meeting.